Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Fume, a natural way to break bad habits. But my friends, I know that stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com, that's T-R-Y-F-U-M.com, and use the code SACRED, that's S-A-C-R-E-D, to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. Again, that's tryfume.com with the checkout code SACRED to save an additional 10% off your order today. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Mood. THCA is a precursor to the famous THC that gives cannabis its high-inducing effect, but when you heat it, it converts to THC, providing access to the classic marijuana high. And since all products are regularly tested at third-party DEF-registered labs, you know that when Mood says their products are legally extracted from hemp plants grown at small, organic farms, they mean it. Try Mood's new THCA flower today. For 20% off your first order and a free gram of THCA flour, go to hellomood.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-M-O-O-D.com. And use the code SACRED at checkout. That's S-A-C-R-E-D. Again, that's hellomood.com with the promo code SACRED for 20% off your first order and a free gram of THCA flour. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by BetterHelp and their convenient, accessible, and affordable brand of online therapy. Whether you're having issues in a relationship, trouble at work or with family, problems pertaining to anxiety and stress, or just about whatever else you can imagine, unencumber yourself. Talk to someone. You'll be glad you did. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash symbols today. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash S-Y-M-B-O-L-S to get 10% off your first month of therapy sessions. That's BetterHelp.com slash symbols for online therapy designed for you. Yes, you. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode number 277. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined, as always, by my son, Chris Raycon. Chris! Good to see you. I like to think that at that you have that little table behind you, you know, like the the, the TV stand thing. Yeah. And I like to think that you sit on a couch with a Swanson's TV dinner on it, yeah. and a glass, a full glass of milk, mm-hmm. and you have the old milk. clicker, yeah, yeah. and you're and right. you're going through and you're watching Game Show Network. Is yeah, any yeah, of that yeah. accurate? Yeah, yeah, I live in 1958. Yeah, you're wearing a bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, my friend? I'm good. You know, it's funny you remark about those tables because like, I had a friend over recently and, and they were like, oh, I didn't know those were real. I only, I've only ever seen those on TV. And I'm like, what do you – like I, I, every family I've ever – been around has had these yeah the tv tray I, yeah you'd put them in the corner of the living room or something yeah you know? they would be like on like a rack of like four yeah. or something right. or, or, or they're really convenient you know i used to use them like as like supplementary nightstands before i had my own nightstands because i was like whatever sure. but uh yeah it's it, they're helpful for you know keeping the laptop up when i'm trying to read a script for something that i'm shooting or whatever so it's it's a bit messy in here but well it's, i guess it's not that messy it's, it's not messy table. you're fine you're no, looking great fine. everything's it's fine, fine. Well, wait, I mean, <laughs> dude, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I'm not even sure. Is there anything bad back here that I can here? I'll show you. Look. That's messy. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah, so much. Did that did that take you guys all for a little bit of a ride there? A little bit. I yeah, got taken for a ride, you know, take them for a ride. Exactly. That's good so good. That's it really such a, is. That's such a good. So- that's such a good song, even though it was the same two seconds on loop forever. Yeah, I was gonna say, what is the loop <laughs> like? Five seconds max. Yeah, literally. Yeah, it's just funny. Be- it's funny because didn't they realize that this was the screen that people would marinate on for a while? Mm. Like it. It makes me feel like when they were making the game of Capcom, they just had it on silent, and somehow when it came, everyone's like. Dude, it's not even a 10 or 15 second loop. It reminds me of, for instance, Crazy Taxi has All I Want by Offspring, which is a short song. That's a minute 30, though. Yeah. You know, so we're talking about something a lot shorter. So, yeah, 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 yeah. And then like um, two minutes later, you hear it again. But he, that's yeah. even that's better. Oh, yeah. What's going yeah. On here. Well, Chris, it's good to see you. I'm going on a, tie, a fucking tirade already. Dustin Furman, executive producer. Hello. Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Survived the mean streets of Chicago. And uh, I felt a little bad because I, I meant to on the last episode I was on. I knew I wasn't going to be here, 
And I just even think about it. So, you know, it was perfect. So people could speculate either my death, uh, my departure from the company, whatever. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I was happy to see that Chicago, not a not as bad as I thought, but I was also staying in a really nice area, like right along the park where the shiny bean thing is a very nice area. But what the fuck are they doing with all this wind? The wind is out of control. The windy city, as they say, windy city. Yeah. It was so windy and rainy the one day we had umbrellas, but they just they were useless. Not only would they not stay open, but the the rain was going sideways. So like, you guys got to work this out in Chicago. I don't know what you guys are doing. Too much deep dish pizza or something, which I didn't have any of that, unfortunately. But uh, I had a great time. Great time at Jimmy's wedding. Happy to be back, though. You know, two episodes missed. I- I'm surprised I'm not getting a warning from Colin yeah, Moriarty. I don't know. It is what it is. I mean, weddings- a demerit. Yeah, it's demer- come on. <laughs> all, my demerits demerit. are kept men- <laughs> all my demerits are kept mentally, and no one Fair. knows where they score, where they score high or low. Oh. So don't worry about that. Social but, credit, but uh, yeah, exactly. But no, <laughs> it's no already social credit. Yeah, I have, I have my own Chinese like <laughs> social credit system. So uh, no, I'm not worried about it. You had to go to a wedding. That's that's the way it goes. Uh, glad you had fun. Um, Chicago. So no one shot at you. No one tried to rob you or anything like that. I found again specifically in the four block radius that i stayed everyone was very pleasant good uh, overall so i'm glad to hear that it was a good time all right good well it's good to gather the family back together welcome guys and welcome all of you out there to sacred symbols of playstation podcast good to be here with you today remember you can get us early and ad free over on patreon patreon.com slash last stand media for early ad free access to this show and all of our other shows as well sacred symbols plus twice a week Special topics, of course, uh, Dagan, my brother and I, who do knock back our n- retro and nostalgia podcast together. He's also the co-host of Punching Up and Constellation. Uh, we did three episodes of Spider-Man. Two of them are up by the time we're recording this and another one will go up in short order. So uh, two and a half hour conversation about 2018 Spider-Man, an hour and a half conversation about the city that never sleeps. And then we just did almost two hours on Miles Morales as well. So I beat all three of those in recent days. I got my Spider-Man 2 game pre-ordered because we're uh, and preloaded. We're recording hours before it comes out. Mm hmm. So we'll obviously be able to go into that next week. Uh, other episodes that are coming out are already out, including I sat down with the um, senior producer of Atari to talk about specifically um, Immortals of Avium and that middle space, how much we think the game cost to make, how much money we think EA lost, why it didn't sell well, and what this means for that space in between, especially because that's a space Atari is interested in getting into at some point as well. Chris recently did a mailbag. We did a uh, spoiler discussion and review discussion on Sea of Stars. Lots going on on Patreon. So patreon.com slash Media. We really appreciate you. Also submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas there on the news feed and so on and so forth. Merch, lastdamedia.store. Do we have anything new to say about merch right now? Um, I don't think uh, we do. I will say this. No. Did I say this already? That we're going to release the other Super Perils of Baking games. We have, yeah. We're probably going to sell 475 of them. I'm going to keep some of them. Um, so it won't be the same amount as we did last time, but um, those are for eBay. Those are those the are for five thousand dollar, you know, since someone has that <laughs> list. Well, I've said this before that I have that we had Barry and I have this dream, although I don't think it's really going to happen of doing like a huge anthology. And it would be cool even if we just did literally 10 of them or something with all of the games and then do this huge box and maybe gave it to people that are important to the company or something. Um, so that's why I want to keep the extras and just for posterity. But right. we'll sell those on Black Friday, I think. We're going to do a Black Friday sale of some sort. I don't really know what's going to happen there yet. Those won't be part of it, but that, those will be available the same day. So you can just do all your shopping for the holiday season at the same time. Lastdaymedia.store. And leave us nice reviews on podcast services. Leave a comment on the video. Like us over there if you'd like. Follow us. Whatever you'd like to do. Whatever makes sense for you. The last two reviews we got on iTunes, one star. Oh. We only ooh. have 92 one-star reviews. We have several thousand reviews. So I need people to go over there. Someone said something about how we're like January 6th people, which what? was a one star review. And then I don't know what the other one was that we like go that the show's just way too long. I don't That's think people I... realize at least maybe I'm misinterpreting how it goes in the rest of the world. But here in the United States, when you listen to a podcast, you can actually shut it off whenever you want. Yeah. So yeah. the reality is, is that nothing is really too long. Because you don't have to, no one is, there's not like the commissar sitting behind you with a fucking pistol to your head, making you listen to the show. So I've never understood the too long comments personally. Never, 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 never. So thank you for that one star review. Go ahead and temper that with some five star reviews over on iTunes. I won't say no. Yeah. Before we get into topics of discussion, lots to talk about today. I want, I meant to bring this up last week, but I wanted to do it for my friend, Sandy Bry, who was recently on Sacred Symbols Plus. He's been on a few times. He's doing the retro PlayStation magazine. 
This is the first issue came in the mail last week. It's really, really cool, man. I'm real proud of them. This is issue number one for September through 2023. It's got all sorts of stuff. So what, what's going on in here? The there's an interview uh, with people that worked at Bend for the origin of Siphon Filter. There's a bunch of retrospectives for, uh, I think, an old Mortal Kombat game. Looks like Legend of Dragoon is in here. Gran Turismo, Gran Turismo games, PS1 and so on and so forth. It's really cool, man. This is this is the vision that I really kind of had in some sense of doing something retro PlayStation related. And I really appreciated in the intro and in his final uh, sentence, he says, uh, I hope you enjoy this issue, which will be the first of many. And thank you to Colin Moriarty and the Sacred Symbols crew or podcast for their concept of a retro PlayStation publication. And then I'm in the special thanks. Last oh, hell yeah, dude. Oh, Colin Moriarty. So I really appreciate that. I thought that was very classy. Um, and I'm really, he did all the work. I just had the idea. So here it is. RPM, go check it out. Too old for gaming. I think it's too old for gaming.com. He has an Etsy. Um, and so on and so forth. I don't know if they're going to kickstart the next one or whatever, but shout out to Sandy Bry. I'm proud of you. All right, let's see here. We have a few things to talk about before we get into the games. news. actually more than usual because I felt like the the inquiries this, this week were unusually on point. Mm. You know, sometimes you guys are more illiterate than other times. Sometimes <laughs> you guys tell the most mundane stories. Sometimes you just really annoy me. But this week, I thought you did a really good job. Ryan Newcomer wrote in on Patreon just like you can. And remember, use the thread in the newsfeed that goes live each week for each show. Long time, first time, he says, Colin, I wanted to thank you for introducing me to a new new term, which you have pronounced as angina or agina. Over the weekend, I used I used it by telling my girlfriend that she was giving me angina as we were picking out our new home lighting. Judging by her expression, I thought I had got her good, but she asked me to repeat it. I repeated it. She laughed and pointed out that it's not a real word. I argued in favor of the pronunciation, but according to Google, it's actually pronounced as angina, which sounds quite close to vagina. What's the story here? I would assume you are pronouncing it correctly. Ryan, the word is agita. You're saying a totally different word, which is angina. Agita (laughs) is A-G-I-T-A. It is an Italian or Jewish colloquialism in the Northeast for stomach indigestion. And so when your mother gets mad at you, she says, get the fuck out of here. You're giving me agita. Or maybe that's what just what my mom said to me. And so that's what I'm talking about. Everyone in my family says it usually in some sardonic way when someone is annoying them. Uh, and that's what the word is. So you're mispronouncing it. You're not even on the right word. Agita. Yeah. A-G-I-T-A. See, agita. This, is, this is confusing, like deeply confusing to me, because this is something that I could almost understand if you had if he had only ever seen the word written. And if you had only seen the word written at like a quick glance, but we've said it verbally multiple times and at no point did it ever sound like angina or angina. So I think well, he thought we were saying or something, you know, yeah, but, like, but even if you, but even if it was like agina, you yeah, know what I mean? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's still not angina. <laughs> like, that's really scary. I, the funny thing so is, is that I think I think that I understand there's a deeper thing here because angina is chest in like chest problems. Is so, it? Yeah. So here it says a condition okay. marked by severe pain in the chest, often also spreading to the shoulders, arms and neck. So he was thinking he was in the right space of mind, but yeah, he was confused because agita is merely like indigestion, stress, anxiety, like annoyance. <laughs> That's Ajita. Right. And it's Ajita is, again, I'm the only, I've never met a person in my travels around the country. I've lived in all these different places outside of Long Island, ever used that word once. Never. So I understand that it's an obscure word, but I had to correct you. You embarrass yourself in front of, who was it? Your wife or your girlfriend? I don't remember. Let's see. Uh, Maybe this person you, hasn't heard it, Chris, girlfriend. because they're deaf and they read the transcript. Oh, Imagine yeah, reading yeah. the transcript for sacred symbols. It's that's, like that's right, war yeah. and peace every week. That'd be wild. Yeah. Yeah, I listen to sacred symbols in Braille. Thank you. <laughs> Tim Chatton wrote in Braille seems so laborious, doesn't it? It's like he, he, I remember what, what was what was a little house on the prairie or one of those where Laura, one of the one of the sisters goes. I think it's Laura will go or maybe not because she's the main character. One of the sisters becomes blind. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? The I've, house never on the prairie I, I've never seen I've never seen a little that. house on the yeah. prairie. Yeah. And and uh, she becomes blind. But this is obviously in the West in like the late 1800s. And someone comes and teaches her Braille, I think. And the books yeah. are like huge. It's, I guess it's the best you can do. Although now we're in a rep. Dude, I would be so scared if I was blind. I When I went to Northeastern, the I think it's the Massachusetts Institute of the Blind. I think that's what it's called. Something mm-hmm. like that. 
was right next to Northeastern. And in fact, Northeastern kind of is like just this huge amalgamation of street blocks and whatever. And then there's private businesses and all these things. So we kind of like we're subsuming it. And those dudes used to just walk in and out of there with their canes, with the most confidence in the world. No, no worries on the snow and the ice and all this. And I was like, geez, it was actually quite inspiring in some way. But it also scared me because I'm like, I don't have that stuff. I'll tell you that right now. Like, I'll be in a fucking ball somewhere. Yeah. In the VR. And like, you know, it, hopefully we can use the Neuralink or whatever and get that, you know, have a San Junipero like dark mirror or can you <laughs> do, black mirror situation. Can, like, can, can, is our, I, I can't imagine that this is possible right now, but I feel like part of me is like not entirely sure. Can you get an eye transplant? Like, is that possible? <sighs> Because it seems like it, I don't know. it seems think? like with, with the amount of tech that we currently have, it seems like it might be. But at the same time, it's it still feels like something that's that will forever be impossible. I don't know why. Something According with the, to eye. the American Academy of Ophthalmology says oh. medical science has no way to transplant, transplant whole eyes at this time. One group of researchers hopes to be able to perform whole eye transplants within a decade. However, when someone receives a transplant today, they're usually having a corneal transplant. Oh. Donor corneas make this amazing sight-saving surgery possible. So at least pieces of the eye. That's um, crazy. My ex's uh, mom was blind. I've brought this up before, and but she became blind as an adult because she had macular degeneration, which is mega scary. And it really broke her down, and I don't blame her at all. I'm not trying to like air anyone's laundry. It's just like I, that's a mem- memorable thing to me where it's like the worse it got, the worse she got. And it's like, yeah, I get it. And people would kind of be mad and frustrated with her. And I'm like, dude, what are you saying? Like, you have any idea how scary this probably is? You've seen <laughs> for 40 or 50 years and now you're just blind. That's crazy. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, very no. scary, man. Very don't like thinking stuff. about that. I don't know. Let me think here. It's like, if, would there be blind gamers? You would obviously say, of course not. But then there's that guy in oh, fucking play Street Fighter 2 by sound or Street Fighter 6, rather. I think it yeah. is by sound, which is and he won. Which yeah. is insane. how do you um, come back from that if you're a professional street fighter player and you lose to the blind guy no offense right but that's that's rough um, that's that's rough. I, yeah that, that's a spiritual awakening i think yeah that's like you got to go into meditation in some some strange woods and then maybe you come <laughs> back wiser uh, it would be like me watching someone play mega man who was blind yeah. and he just somehow was way better than me yeah it's like well that's I have to like read. You're exactly right. I have to go become a hermit. It's you have be to be like you yeah. have to look on, on like the bright side and be like, well, at least it's a person, mm. you know, and not like a, I don't know, a fucking parrot, <laughs> you know, would, like be- beating your ass at Street Fighter without even looking at the screen, <laughs> screaming like a, insults that it's heard once, you know, imagine when we can finally teach like an ape to play one of these games or something. And then you're really going to have you're going to have your fucking you know, your Thoreau moment in the woods in Massachusetts. You're gonna have to go live there for 15 years to find yourself. There's yeah. no coming back from that. Ape surfs. I saw them at the San Diego zoo. Like when I took my parents there and it was, it's, it's so disturbing watching them because they're oh. just people. They're just, they're just like yeah. tiny people, man. Like, and it's like, I think there was like a rule. And so I think I might've brought this up on the show before, but like there's some zoo somewhere that was like, stop showing the, sh- stop showing the monkeys, your phones. They're becoming obsessed with them. <laughs> like actually like straight up, like there's like a rule against showing, like the certain i guess all primates your phones which is a little scary yeah it's like they're almost really ready to break out or something you know? yeah yeah oh my planet God. of the apes <laughs> who postmated five thousand bananas on the company credit card <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome love it um gd wrote in and said hey gents i was floored last week to hear that pen colin rips and sacred symbols episodes is just a full-on dab thc pen I always thought the pen was nicotine or CBD, but you're telling me you've been ripping 95% THC oil on four hour podcast with the boys. How do you do it? Stay with the Stay with gents. Thanks for everything. Thank you, GD, for writing in. Um, I've said this before. I don't really get high anymore. I haven't for years. It's, it's now it's it's an anxiety it, like the, the. I have to tamp it all down mm. or it starts to bubble up. You understand? It starts to bubble up like this bubble. And so you have to keep it down. Yeah, I, I say because we we're sponsored by um a couple of different companies like uh like vaping and smoking and all these different things and um and natural air, which is cool. This thing fume, which I'm actually kind of interested in. And it's a sponsor of us. It's like just air. It's not even electronic. It's just air like pulled over a cylinder. It's kind of neat. 
But I say on my ad recently for mood, which is like um, THCA and Delta eight, it's like you don't. I use medical grade THC. I have a medical prescription for it. Most of you don't need this. In fact, I don't think most of you want this heat, you know, and so I think things like that are a little bit tamped down for you. Probably better. You know, yeah. but hey, to, to each his own. I mean, the weed we were smoking when I was in high school and we were buying it from like warehouses in Queens was like literally grass clippings compared to this shit. Right. So I've come up with it, but I can only imagine like I smoked with my dad in California the last time he came out to see me and he hadn't smoked in years, probably since the 80s, maybe. And or maybe the 90s or whatever. And he he was out like a light mm. after that shit, which was awesome. I loved it. Yeah. He's, and he said to me verbatim, you smoke this entire thing. <laughs> oh man that's awesome <laughs> colin i think i yeah. want to tell the audience yeah. i have never once had a an important meeting with you that did not involve a joint yeah uh that's, that's over usually, zoom yeah. or over zencaster or in real life yeah every yeah. time we've ever talked about my pay you have had a joint and i would not have it any other way that's my relaxation method it yeah. keeps yeah. me i'm a very very anxious person and very, very worried. It's important that I disable that as much as humanly possible. There's that comedian. I think he was from one of the popular like left wing podcasts. I can't remember his name, but he, he did a special recently. I don't know if it was Red Scare or one of those shows. And he left. He has a Greek name. I don't know. If that Stavros? Yeah, maybe that's what it is. He's yeah, like Stavros. kind of like he's kind of like a little heavy set. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's Stavros. Yeah. Yeah. He's hysterical. And he did this whole thing about like smoking weed. And he's like, oh, almost had a thought. <laughs> Or whatever, <laughs> and then he had, and then he has to smoke again, and that's exactly how I feel. So, uh, Sacred yeah. Symbols Plus idea that I don't know if I would even agree to. Uh, do it. It's like a normal episode, but Chris and I have to keep pace with you <laughs> with hits. Uh, how long will the episode last? I don't know. I mean, it's uh, not long for me. I'm uh, not proud of it. You know, that would be a funny idea. That's a, that, <laughs> I, like I, I've thought about that too about like just like an episode that we're we're all just. <laughs> Placed. I, I was I wanted to do that for a while, but also like that's so. How would that would be a seven hour podcast where half of us are asleep by the end of it? Yeah, probably. yeah. For sure. I always people do ask like, why don't you guys do a drunk episode? Why don't you do a high episode? I feel like it's kind of, I don't want to say low brow because obviously our t everything we do is low brow. I'm like, yeah, but we can. We're very. I I would like to think we can do it without it. Maybe someday though. Uh. I don't think I think it would make me way worse as far as entertainment value. Just it me. might make me worse. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it does. I have no idea. But it's uh, <laughs> he has I'm no way no, of but knowing. You actually, <laughs> plays though, Colin. <laughs> There's no way of actually. <laughs> we'll never you know. I was saying, though, but you're just saying you're at a baseline. Yeah, exactly. So can you get high if you wanted to? Yeah, I could. Like I, I, so the, there's there are little secrets like I buy really low, not really low because there's only so low you can go. But I buy like lower THC and even lower quality flour, especially not flour so much because I like smoking the flour out of the bong. But my vape pens, I go through a cartridge every couple of days, every few days or whatever, which is um, good. But uh, that's a little bit of a lower quality than if I got, you know, really, really good stuff, that would be half as or twice as much. I don't need that level heat because there are people that that really do like mega high THC doses and even, um, you know, with edibles and stuff, which I don't mess with at all. So, um, yeah, I, I with the uh, in tincture when you get the little like, you know, snot looking stuff. Right. That, like that's like, drugs, that that's too crazy. much for me. That's too close. to That's too close to smoking crack. Yeah. <laughs> For my taste. Once I was uh, out at a bar in San Francisco and this guy came up to me and asked me for my lighter. I was smoking cloves at the time. This was, so this is probably like 2007 or 2008. And then uh, he just smoked his crack pipe right next to me with my, my lighter. And I was with this girl and she's like, you just gave that fucking crack at a lighter. And I'm like, I didn't mean to. I thought he was going to like light up a cigarette like a normal person. Never forget that as long as I live. And ever since then, I'm like, well, I can't smoke. I'm not going to smoke. Crack. You, you just you just gave a crack at a lighter. But yeah. As if that's like the man. biggest problem. I went through a clove phase from 2006 to 2007 or eight, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't even know yeah. what clove I, is. Clove cigarettes. The boys. Yeah. Oh, me and the boys used to smoke clove cigarettes in college, and eventually one day I just couldn't do it anymore. They just not that we were smoking like six a day. I was probably having like one every other day. Something about that spice level. I was like, I can't. I'm, Dude, it's, it's like a. It's too much. 
it is and it's oh, yeah. and it's it you stink after you smoke it and yeah. they burn really really slowly so you feel like it will never ever 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 go out the jarum that was the brand i were uh, they're called oh, Dijarum Dijarum Blacks. Blacks. yeah i think i did the jarum specials which i think came in like a purple box or you know like a maroon box or something oh like yeah that. yeah yeah i remember this yeah yeah we always went for the Dijarum blacks they call them uh, they used to call them beaties right that was like, wasn't that the nickname in the seventies for them or the eighties, maybe even earlier than that, where like B, I think they called them, I could be wrong. That could be like a different term, but something like that. Chris, you've never seen these or heard, heard of these before. No, I, I, I never smoked really anything. Like I, I, I was never really a cig- cigarette person because everybody that I knew, like everybody knew that I had smoked cigarettes, uh, when I was a kid, just it was just so off putting to me, mm-hmm. <laughs> just like the, it's, it's honestly mostly the smell to me where i was just like this is so i i hate this and i never i don't really want to be around this so cigarettes never really appealed to me i only started like i think i only really smoked joints and cigars and even cigars is like maybe like twice a year kind of like special yeah. occasion type deal joints even oh. even probably fewer so because i just rely on i just have gummies now but we should get cigars for the wedding that'd be great well, yeah, you should there you'll there's a it's like indoor outdoor so um, Fuck yeah. Yeah. Chris. Uh, yeah. Dude, Smokey's one of the he, you know, in our writing here, he mentions about hitting a, uh, a nicotine pen. I wish, dude, I wish I could hit a nicotine pen all day, every day of my life. But uh, I just can't. I won't, you know, try to stay away. But it's uh, it's different, Chris, when you smoke it, when you're the one smoking it than smelling it, you know? Oh, yeah. I, I assume so. It's just it's also in addition to just the extraneous like smell factor of it just the thought of even just weed like i'm not really that big on smoking it either like just the, the i'm not big on the burning yeah inhaling mm-hmm. smoke like it just like the whole thing to me like i like cigars specifically because it's like it's the aesthetic and it feels kind of regal almost not regal but you know what i mean like it feels like fancy and sophisticated for some reason even sure. though it's like even though it's just this big <laughs> this big stick of poison you're just slowly. Burning. It really is, but it really is. But at least you're not like there's no like inhaling going on. It's really just for the flavor of it, and I I I like that. But even that that I like, I, I only it's like I said, it's like maybe like twice a year max at this point. Maybe five times a year on like a crazy year. So like it's I don't know. I've, it's smoke culture has always been like very very distant for me. I didn't have weed until I was like 22 or something. 21. This wasn't really like a thing out where I was. I was already a walking weed leaf by the time I was 21. So you're lucky that the we all know the only thing Chris will smoke is pole. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) No, I, I it's funny. Cigarettes to me, I don't mind being around them. I'll smoke them if someone has them in very specific situations. I don't think I've had a cigarette in several years, actually, but I've never bought them or anything like that. And I find them incredibly harsh. If I smoke a cigarette the way I smoke a joint, I will cough for minutes and minutes and minutes, which just goes to show you how harsh cigarettes are compared to weed and how people smoke a pack of them a day or whatever. It's like, Jesus I couldn't even Christ. imagine. I I'm like, not even, yeah. I'm not even saying that my lungs or that what I'm doing is healthy. It's not, but there's yeah. no, there's no way that it's, that's why I was so confused about, vaping where and i know that it had specifically to do with these chemicals they were using and not the act of vaping but it's like when people say oh vaping's just as bad for you as as burning you know smoking the cigarette i'm like there's just no way that's true mm-hmm. like i don't give a f- that just doesn't make any sense to anyone that's ever smoked anything even pole you know <laughs> so <laughs> even pole <laughs> <laughs> thanks for writing in sacred symbols is sponsored by fume a natural way to break bad habits Learn more now at fume.com, that's F-U-M, and use the code SACRED at checkout. In life, we sometimes fall prey to routines that aren't great, and while going cold turkey is always an option, sometimes it's best to give in to our inclinations and work around what draws us instead. In a world clouded with the haze of vapor and the like, Fume allows users to pull completely natural flavored air that's quite unlike anything you've ever experienced before. The secret to Fume are these little disposable cylinders that come in a variety of flavors, like raspberry lemon, white cranberry, maple pepper, or my favorite, orange vanilla, amongst others. Just pop them into Fume's air device and pull away, drawing an ephemeral burst of flavor that hits the spot without worry. The Fume air device is itself a well-built wooden and metallic tool that uses no electricity. This is a huge part of the draw for me. And while its possibilities are endless when it comes to cessation, you can be like me too, just a dude looking for a little flavor in his life just cause. 
But my friends, I know that stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com, that's T-R-Y-F-U-M.com, and use the code SACRED, that's S-A-C-R-E-D, to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. Again, that's tryfume.com with the checkout code SACRED to save an additional 10% off your order today. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Mood and their line of THCA and Delta 8 products, available now at hellomood.com, that's M-O-O-D. Use the code SACRED at checkout for 20% off your first order. So even casual listeners of this show know that I'm a longtime marijuana user, going back about 20 years now. I'm getting old. It's actually been of great help to me, and I'm grateful for it. But while medical marijuana does the trick for me here in Virginia, as it did back in California, the reality is that there are plenty of you out there that don't need to smoke medical-grade THC. In fact, I'd say most of you aren't looking for that level of heat, even if you think you are. Instead, you may be looking for something a little less potent and completely legal, no matter where in these United States you live. That's why I'm so eager to tell you about Mood's line of THCA and Delta-8 offerings, from bud, or what people like to call flower these days, to pre-rolls, to gummies, and beyond. THCA is a precursor to the famous THC that gives cannabis its high-inducing effect, but when you heat it, it converts to THC, providing access to the classic marijuana high. And since all products are regularly tested at third-party DEF-registered labs, you know that when Mood says their products are legally extracted from hemp plants grown at small organic farms, they mean it. And if you want to get really into the nitty-gritty, become the sommelier of THCA by seeking strands that meet your needs, from euphoric to chill, and from energized to creative and beyond. And if you're interested in Delta 8, another legal cannabinoid, this one known for a more mild approach, Mood has your guys' backs too. Listen, you know I know my THC, so believe me when I tell you, Mood has you covered. Try Mood's new THCA flower today. For 20% off your first order and a free gram of THCA flower, go to hellomood.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-M-O-O-D.com. And use the code SACRED at checkout. That's S-A-C-R-E-D. Again, that's hellomood.com with the promo code SACRED for 20% off your first order and a free gram of THCA flour. All right. Let's see here. Oh, James Pies has an interesting um, conundrum here. Chris, I think you and I will be able to speak to this. He says, hey, fellas, when is it okay to take an abandoned package from the mailroom lobby of an apartment complex? I have lived in this building for just over three years, and unfathomably, there has been a box sitting there ever since I moved in. It's a little larger than your average shoebox, and it's addressed to a mark who I assume no longer lives or has unfortunately perished. They are here or <laughs> unfortunately perished. The outside has an MLB logo, Major League Baseball, and it's heavy as hell. So I'm assuming there's something pretty rad inside. Am I free to investigate after so much time has passed, or do I leave this mystery box unmolested? Thank you, as always, for Hi. the phenomenal content. Um, there's that word. Again. I don't know that it has to be you, but see, this is a very different situation than what happened with me in Santa Monica, Chris, especially, which is when I had a, there was a mail room that I used for several years, which is like, if you didn't get your package within two hours, who the hell knew what was going to happen to that thing? There was, there was nothing sticking around that room. So yeah. the fact that this package has been there for you live amongst some pretty good people, three plus years, open it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the statute, the, like the statute of limitations on this has passed. I like what beyond the first year, I think you would have been, you would have been free to do so. Right. And that's that was like and that'd be overkill because I have had packages go to previous apartments of mine and I've had to like go like because like I don't know, like something in there, something in like a sponsor system just didn't update properly. And I've gone back and, you know, uh, but this is usually within like within a week or two, you know, of like finding out that this package is there. Maximum, I think I had a package sitting at an old apartment for like a month and even that it wasn't like an important package so three years dude open it yeah fucking open it that is an abandoned package if i've ever seen one totally mark's what's mark's gonna swing in one day and be like i'm here for that that baseball package he's probably dead more than likely he just left yeah or like if you want to be like an extra well no because there's no way if somebody's living in that apartment now they would have taken that package or said something about it so my assumption is that the apartment's also (laughs) <laughs> completely abandoned so you got your own apartment break into that apartment have a nice little uh you know have a party in there you know with you with your little package why not who cares it's over everyone wants to know yeah i'm really curious what, about it what i would do especially if you're not really interested in what's inside which is a pretty good reasonable chance you're not going to be is i would just open it and leave it disassembled in the mailroom so everyone knows 
Yeah. Everyone's curious. <laughs> that's yeah. You're not the only person that's curious. Make that's a little a museum idea. exhibit for everybody. One of those little write ups on like the really nice paper that's like on the that'll be like on a on a display and it'll say like 2023 <laughs> um, dis- discovered package in mailroom and then you can just yeah, you yeah. Can write up a little thing. You can put it in like a little display case like in a museum with like a little, a little plaque. Right. Yeah, that's right. Thank you for writing in. Calcifer wrote in, said, hey, CCD bro chachos. I was perusing or perusing YouTube as I do and came across a video of comedian, sometimes show host Anthony Jeselnik. I love Jeselnik and him talking about his role and contributions to different roasts made me think of the possibility of you guys roasting each other about your gaming takes or preferences. I really like the hot takes episode that you guys did. That's on Sacred Symbols Plus. It would be fun to see it taken to the next level. Also, would love to see Chris flex those mean comedy muscles. Let me know what you all think. Would be great to see something like that in a live show format. It's funny because I don't know what ended up happening with it. It just never came together. But back in 2015 or 2016, there was going to be a roast. There, people were talking about getting a, a PAX East like, or PAX West, one of them, a roast of Greg Miller. And I was actually going to host it. Um, and there was going to be this whole thing. And then and, and just never came together. People were kind of trying to do it. And I was like, that's actually a really funny idea. I think roasts are hysterical, probably amongst the funniest comedy. The way I find a lot of different comedians, including Anthony Jeselnik, was through roasts of various kinds. And I would totally subject myself to a roast, not only of video games, but just of anything, because I think it would be really good content, really funny. So maybe like one of our live shows one day can be a roast or something. I don't know. That would be funny. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. How would you guys feel about that? Because I'll, I, it can be all about me, and and but like that means that I get to aim at everyone else too. And my favorite part about about roast, in my opinion, is all of the flack that people get that have nothing to do with it at all. <laughs> just the people that are on stage and just how it becomes more mean to them sometimes. And it's like good stuff. It's very very funny to me. So I'm down with it. We don't even have to do it a big game takes. So let's just do it straight up. Oh, a so straight up roast. Yeah, I support it. Objo Gaming wrote in said Chris Chan is back to posting videos online. <laughs> potential sacred plus episode perhaps a sonic superstars spoiler cast just trying to provide the viewers with the content they crave dustin thoughts i mean um you you texted us about something i uh, what is what is even going on with him at this point the thing we're we're so mystified by here is that he's amongst us in when our in our area like he lives around here somewhere <laughs> yeah well a few months ago after he was released from prison someone in our discord saw him at a event playing Magic the Gathering. And so we had a, an exclusive Chris Chan photo uh, amongst us. So yeah, you, anything could happen at the wedding. Um, but dude, these That's videos, crazy. I don't know, Chris, if you saw either one of them. Oh, these of are truly uh, the next level of just pure, it, it's getting to the, I mean, it's been to the point where it's been very, very sad for a very long time. But I, I watched both of them and thought, I, I no longer think I find this as, you know, I don't, this is not entertaining. Uh, even just as a watcher <laughs> by, I just feel it took you this bad. long. <laughs> I guess the, the, when I started to get into the documentary, this was right before the jail stuff happened. So there wasn't anything. New right, happening. right. So I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. This is kind of funny. But, but now that it's actively happening, kind of put a new light on it for me where I thought every view in this video is feeding this guy and uh, not literally, but feeding the derangement. And I kind of felt bad about it. I don't know what to think. My world has been shaken. You're part of the history now, my friend, you're, you're, you're living through it. You're living through a future, (laughs) a future episode of this documentary. (laughs) Oh, I know dude. What if he ever commented on, like he said, like if we talk shit about Sonic or, or whatever, and he, he mentioned sacred symbols. I mean, that would be, that would be deep part of the universe. Let me be clear. Point. I don't like I don't... sacred symbols. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. He's welcome on uh, Sacred Symbols Plus. Oh, man. No. Straight up. <laughs> I don't know. I don't wow, know. Chris saying, I don't know. That's something. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> uh, then where in that episode, then where in a Geno Samuel episode you yeah, know what i mean like true, that's that's that's, that's that's the thing about that entire look i i, I will say that w- when you texted those that video with the george it, bush 
I, I, I just I didn't even put a, a text. It's just the George Bush getting the a second tower is hit. Yeah, it was, it was a good Christian. Nine eleven. Nine eleven. It, it was happening. it was a good it was a good preface. I had already seen. I was already in the middle of watching it because I had seen. I think because I saw. I watched that when I clicked on that video. It said uploaded like like ten minutes ago or something. So like I was yeah. like on the like on the ground floor of it. I was like, what's going on? Ground zero. And uh, there's some good music in there. Uh, look, man. Where I wonder how long this is going to persist because at this point he's been internet immortal for a while. Um, I don't know. It's it's I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Chris Chan Sacred Symbols Plus seems 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 really scary. <laughs> I want. I have. I couldn't even tell you the number of questions I would have for him. Oh yeah, like, no. they would be absolutely myriad and endless and i told you my brother-in-law is an administrator in schools here in our county the county where chris chan went to school Mm -hmm, and i asked him about that specific high school because it comes up on i think it's manchester comes up on um on on the geno samuel stuff and i'm like is he like a cult icon there or something because and he was he didn't really know much about it and i was like that's so interesting to me because i imagine that Zoomer culture would be all over this as if he went to school there and you knew teachers and all this stuff. How is that possible that he's not some weird cold figure? You walk, you're walking the halls that this fucking yeah. weird dude it, like Chris Chan walked through. It's, it's like that. Uh, it's like that. Um, What is it? I, I can't remember exactly where it was. It might've been a school or it might've been an office building where they knocked down a wall behind a bathroom and they found like a shrine to Danny DeVito. <laughs> like just built. Did you ever see that? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> it was like a, it was like an abate. Like some. If you Google like Danny DeVito shrine, it's crazy. But like, you'd imagine that in that school there must be like some it room, is. like some secret room dedicated to this guy. Because like, how could you not? Yeah. Like how could there? How, how could there not be? Yeah. The, the way the news covers wow. it too is the, the way the news covers it too is amazing. It's like there's a shrine to of all people, Danny DeVito. In that in that like newscaster voice, yeah, I found a I found a uh, a Twitter with it. That's yeah. hysterical. Yeah, that's it's crazy. so weird. Yeah, and I'm sure it's done for no reason other than I I really do feel like kids because because me and my friends used to do this all the time. Like we would we would arrange things in such a way, not even because we wanted to, but just because we understood that a third person experience of coming across it would be fucking mind numbing. Sure. To witness. You know what I mean? Just 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 to fuck with people. It's why I don't believe in really any any ghost stories or anything like that, because I I just firmly believe so deeply in in people's desire to fuck with people around them for no real reason. Like there's like and there's no reason that you really need to mess with people in that way. And so that it's it's completely demystified that entire (laughs) genre of human experience for me. But yeah, there's a shrine to Danny DeVito in this. Yeah, in there's this the, the, I saw the pictures of it. Very funny. Yeah, it's crazy. Very, very funny. All right. Two things about the wedding coming up a couple weeks, and then we'll move on. Mm. H wrote in and said, hey, boys, how drunk are you all planning to get at the wedding? Is anyone giving a speech? I once had to before and got rather drunk to get past a speech impediment. I was 20 and got way too drunk puking on the way home. Good day. Nice. You can't get that drunk at someone's wedding. It's just not that's not cool in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I've been pretty drunk at weddings though. I gave this, I was my brother's best man in 2002. I was 17 and I gave that speech and my uncle Mike was busting my balls the entire time before him. He's like, did you write the speech? Did you write the speech? I'm like, I'm not writing anything. I'm just going to say what I, what comes from the heart. And I did. And it was great. And I think it's on video somewhere. We should probably try to upload that at some point, mm. which would be funny. Yeah. And, uh, as far as ours is concerned, we have a very specific run of like the dj like we're not doing like the open you know like when you go to a wedding sometimes and it's like people can just say nice things or like my sister did that but for us mm. it's like no uh too dangerous yeah well not even that it's just like it's just it becomes too weird because then people feel like they need to one-up each other or like oh maybe i should say something where i was like no it's just gonna be like my dad mike is dad uh um, yeah maybe my brother will say something and then me uh and that's that's it no one else go for the mic Drink as much as you like, of course, but within reason. Have fun. Yeah. Finally, Hashim Bar- or Barakat wrote in and said, good day, Sacred Dons. With Colin and Micah's wedding coming, I wonder if they're planning on doing bachelor or bachelorette parties. And what do Chris and D- Dustin think of the concept of bachelor parties? Thank you for the wonderful content. Wish you all a great week and a wonderful wedding to Colin and Micah. I've been to many, actually, bachelor parties, and they've all probably like six or seven at this point. 
and they're all different. I've done the very traditional, like go to a strip club and go to a bar and all that kind of stuff. I've done like weekends away, like destination ones. And I've done just like dinners out and days out and stuff. I went to, a, I think, a Giants game in San Francisco for one, which was fun. It's not really my thing, though. But here's what I was saying. I don't like gather. I, I really it's very strange because we do this show, but I don't like being the center of attention in real life. I don't. Everyone who knows me knows that. So doing even like a wedding is a pretty big deal. And I feel like yeah. I'm already I already feel Chris and I talked about this last week a little bit. I already feel like I'm putting people out like while Mike is worried about, oh, I hope everything works out and the, like the vendors come through and, every, and I'm like, dude, I'm not worried about anything but people having a good time. I don't care about anything else. Right. And she's like in this whole other place. So that's kind of where I am. And with that in mind, I'm like bachelor party. It's just too much. So last month, uh, I think my family felt bad that we didn't do anything because my family's very celebratory. They love just like going crazy for random things. And it's not, this is not random, but they yeah. just like to celebrate. They're very kind in that way. And uh, so they, sp- everyone, like my dad came down to Virginia and everyone's kind of split up for one day. And I went to a really nice dinner with the guys. Micah went to a really nice dinner with the girls. And I was like, that's very nice. Not necessary. But the reason that I'm putting this off as well is I just turned 39 last weekend <clears throat> and um, my 40th birthday. So as I said before, I, I don't do the birthday party thing either. Ever since I was a little kid, actually, I was afraid of like, what if no one comes kind of thing, you know? <laughs> and so I think I had like a birthday party or two in elementary school that was really fun. But then I never had another birthday party until uh i turned 21 in college and i got fucking wrecked and i've told that story before i was like throwing up in the back of a cab and all of that and then no more birthday parties and then 30 i had a destination birthday in kentucky and so i'm turning 40 in october i'm going to do another destination birthday probably in kentucky again Uh, because i thought that that was like a really fun cool one just do the bourbon trail um like hire a driver get like an escalator like a van and just have this person drive us from fucking distillery to distillery and you just get drunk i think that sounds fun to me so that's the reason i don't want to put people out too much it's not that i don't appreciate a bachelor party or a bachelorette party it's up to you but to me it mm-hmm. just doesn't really ride with me and since i'm going to be putting people out next year or at least trying to put people out let's take it easy you know you're already coming to the wedding how much how much do you want to demand of someone that's i guess what i'm saying not that it's not fun or something but yeah. It puts too much pressure on people. It's like, yeah, come to my wedding and come to the fucking bachelor party and, you know, let's have brunch the day after. And let's, it's like, all right, just come to the wedding. <laughs> yeah. And then and don't worry about anything else. Yeah. Okay. Especially because the Jets play the Giants, I think at 1 p.m. the next day. So oh. I don't have time for that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get my notes here. My other, my other. So notepad. ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going on our honeymoon this year. We're going uh, next year. And we were not really entirely sure where we're going to go yet. Um, I'm yeah. really down for whatever, I guess. Go to Japan, really... Colin. I'd like time. to. I think Mike is a little skeptical of that flight. She kind of blames it on me because I told her how long the flight is. Like, I, It's not as bad as going to Europe from California, but my flights from California to Japan were still and back were still pretty laborious. And she's not crazy about air travel and all of that. Although I've been trying to tell her. I'm not ever flying coach international ever again. So oh, man, like never so in a million easy. years. Am I doing that? Just fall asleep. No, on the plane. Just, That's what yeah, you could just, do. I'm saying if no, I'm saying to Micah, if oh. you guys are not flying in coach, You've got like a bed thing. Oh, that's just what I'm saying. So that's why you're trying to sell out. It's easy. Yeah, you got like your little pod, you know? Yeah, yeah, it'd be super just, easy. Just pass out, dude. Just go yeah. to sleep. Yeah. Well, I'll let you guys know when we know more. I'd like to go back. I haven't been in 10 years, nine years. So who the hell knows? Go to Chernobyl. Go. Oh, I could go to, we could go to Chernobyl. A little dangerous over there for multiple reasons now. Nah, I, think Ukraine, it's, I think it's, I think it's under control. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's under control. Yeah. But now nature needs to take its course. Mm, yeah, Plus yeah. there's a whole war going on over there as well. So you don't. Oh yeah. But like aside, outside, outside of the war and the nuclear radiation and the, and the out, if you, if you remove that from the situation, it's a gorgeous place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Priapot or whatever that city's called with the, the like the, the abandoned city, the ghost city. <laughs> yeah, so Pri- Pripyat or whatever. The Pripyat, the, yeah, there was like the, <laughs> I had somebody I, I walked into a it just reminds me like I was walking because I live like really close to my friends, like really close, like walking distance. So I'll like pop in, I'll do the Kramer pop in every now and again. I'll raid their fridge and leave. But I walked I walked into their house and they were like, Oh, that that that'd be a nice that shirt would look great in tie-dye or whatever. This is what my friend said to me. I was like, this shirt would look great if it was a completely different shirt is what you, is what you just said to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like Chernobyl would be a really gorgeous place without without the nuclear radiation and the war. It's like, yeah, I'm sure it would. <laughs> Thanks. 
<laughs> I want to go see like the squirrels with three heads and shit, like the new species yeah, yeah, yeah. of trees. Yeah, there's a cow that writes in cursive over there. <laughs> I love it. That would be cool. I would. I, I wish I was. I'm an adventurer, but I'm not a traveler, so it would be hard for me to go to a place like that just because it's like, ugh, I have to. Go, <laughs> I have to do. You know, I have to like do this. Yeah, being yeah, yeah. there is not a problem. It's like just going there. That's the case with almost anything, though. Anyway. And like I said before, I've been overseas enough. I'm very fine staying in the United States if necessary. That's totally fine with me. Nowhere else to go. Mm. Fine. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by BetterHelp and their convenient, accessible, and affordable brand of online therapy. Learn more now at betterhelp.com slash symbols. So most of us here in the adult world understand, at least conceptually, what we have to do to lead productive, meaningful, happy lives. Knowing what's good for us, after all, is relatively simple when compared to actually living a life that's good for us. Sometimes we just need someone to shine a spotlight and help us get focused. And one such positive way to fashion a better life is to act assertively and help yourself. Imagine, for instance, what you could unencumber yourself from if only you could talk to someone whose entire job is to listen to you and provide meaningful, actionable, and educated feedback on just about anything that's on your mind. This is what therapy is all about. But the unfortunate reality about therapy is that it's simply inaccessible to far too many people. Some of you don't have insurance or the financial means to afford traditional therapy out of pocket. Others don't have access to transportation or even a quality provider in your area to choose to visit, period. This is why I'm so excited about BetterHelp and why I've been pleased to have them as a sponsor of this very show for years. Using the power of the internet, BetterHelp lowers all of the traditional barriers for therapy, making it more accessible to more people than ever. The key is in talking to your licensed therapist remotely instead of in person, keeping costs low and options high, since you can choose to speak to your therapist via video, audio, or even just by chat, and you can do so from the comfort of, well, wherever you have an internet connection. As someone who has benefited from therapy greatly in the past and who is currently seeing someone in the present, I can gladly attest to the efficacy of therapy. You have to keep an open mind and be patient with yourself and honest with your provider. That's it. My friends, I truly believe that therapy can help you right now. Whether you're having issues in a relationship, trouble at work or with family, problems pertaining to anxiety and stress, or just about whatever else you can imagine, unencumber yourself. Talk to someone. You'll be glad you did. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash symbols today. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash S-Y-M-B-O-L-S to get 10% off your first month of therapy sessions. That's betterhelp.com slash symbols for online therapy designed for you. Yes, you. All right. Dustin, we have something to talk about. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. I feel like it's necessary to, to discuss this. People wrote in about it, but I'm also not happy about it. And uh, I'm going to leave it to you to say what you to introduce what we're going to talk about and to say your piece about it, because it really has most to do with you. And then I'll kind of fill people in on a few things and say what I have to say. I don't know if Chris has any opinions on the matter either, but um, I leave it to you. So take it away. Sure. So as many of you know, it's no secret. I've been a big Easy Allies fan for many years. Brad and I have collaborated on different things. I've listened to them since before I worked here. They were part of big inspiration of me wanting to do what I do now. And uh, last week, I had the chance of being able to be on a show that I've listened to for many years, Frame Trap, was invited by my friend Brad, and we had a fantastic time together on the show with some of the rest of the crew, and also the audience had a fantastic time listening to it. It was a, what many people called was a dream crossover, since we have so many crossover listeners between them and us. While I was away at Jimmy's wedding, um, I found out that they had made an official statement in their discord that it was to to summarize it, but to also be clear that they wanted to apologize to people because uh, the usual suspects came out, uh, basically saying that we were transphobic or that I was connected to you who was racist, sexist, transphobic, whatever, all the the go-to things. And um, basically said that in the future, they would be uh, vetting people better and also called the episode a mistake. So (laughs) when I saw this come out, obviously it was uh, amongst when I was very busy. I didn't really know what to say or or do. Clearly you guys uh, very much saw this and made a very big deal out of it as I understandably, as I under, you know, totally understand. And this really blew up. And I 
want to first say that I really appreciate everybody supporting me um, and supporting us as a company when something like this unfairly happens to us. So while this went down, I had a few different conversations with people at Easy Allies and particularly uh, there's an apology to the apology that came out from Daniel Bloodworth. And he and I had some good conversations. Um, I didn't know what their statement was going to be. Uh, but when it came out, I really had a tough time because while I appreciated that there was an apology for how, how, what happened, there was really no course correction. There was no, what we said was wrong. The post itself of the apology on their discord is still up. And I felt very unsatisfied because of the haziness of the apology. Um, this was obviously really tough for me as someone who's liked them for a long time. And as someone who's been very good friends with Brad, he's my boy. We talk all the time. So I really wanted to make things right with them, even though it seemed like kind of that ship was sailed. So I made an offer to them that said I, I explained that I felt like there were some issues with the apology because of what wasn't clear. And so I said, hey, let me fly myself out and we can talk about this on the next frame trap and we can clear this up because it's not cleared up right now. Um, that proposal was denied by them. And it was made clear to me that I am no longer welcome on Easy Allies content and Brad will no longer be allowed to be on our content. And so, yeah, I really want to just present all of those facts to you. These are what happened and you can decide whatever you want to do with that. But there's a few final things I want to say. If Easy Allies as a whole truly deems my appearance a mistake, they should remove the episode. Um, just take it down because the fact that it's still up is weird to me if that's what they believe. Second, I want to make clear that Brad and I are good friends and we're totally cool. We've talked a lot throughout this process. I will not speak for him. I personally believe he's in a very complicated situation right now. With all this said, I am no longer a patron or listener of Easy Allies. And uh, again, I'll let you guys decide what you want and Colin can say whatever he wants. The only thing I ask is that if you decide that you want to take action as far as where you spend your patronage or whatever, don't be a dick about it. Don't um, don't be what they think that our audience is, you know. Um, and I, I, I know that there's very few people that would say something like that, but I want to be clear about that too. So it's a very shitty situation, a very painful situation, but I'm happy to move on at this point. So Colin, do you think that, I mean, I know you and I have talked a lot throughout this process too. Um, and I guess I'll let you take it away. Yeah. Um, well, I have some things to say. <laughs> I actually, I actually typed out notes, which just to make sure I touch on all the things that I want to, I want to say. Um, and I'm speaking all of this from the absolute heart. And I mean what I'm going to say, and I don't know if it'll come off as mean to some people and I don't really care. Um, I don't think that what happened to you is especially fair. I feel bad for you. I also feel bad for Brad, but here's the reality. Easy allies is a failing company. It has an anchor that's dragging it down. It will be at the bottom of the ocean soon. And nothing is going to stop that from happening. And the reality is, is that Dustin taking the time to do a show like Frame Trap is irrelevant to us because we don't need or want any promotion. They need the help. And so for Dustin to take his time out to go do their show and for them to show him this level of disrespect is, as I told Dustin extensively in my own thoughts, unacceptable. There's a lot to say here, and I want to begin just with what I just said, which was Dustin was doing them a favor. 
The second thing I want to say as someone who runs a substantially more popular and substantially bigger enterprise with lots of people doing work for me is that the key to this endeavor is to let people have different points of views and different desires and want different people on their different shows and not try to control things too much. One of the clear reasons that Easy Allies is failing is that there's too many cooks in the kitchen. Not only that many of their most important cooks had left, but that there's just too many people making decisions and too many people stepping all over each other. And that's why Easy Allies is inevitably going to die. But there are people that appear on this content, whether it's Sacred Symbols Plus or especially on Defining Duke Ultimate, that I don't like at all. Or that I don't agree with, specifically with Sacred Symbols Plus. I don't think I'd have someone I didn't like on Sacred Symbols Plus, but that I don't agree with at all. When I had Matt Stoller on, I got a lot of bullshit from people, including people leaving Patreon. But see, the difference between Last Stand Media and Easy Allies is the best person that knows how to run Last Stand Media is me. And I guess for Easy Allies, the best people that know how to run their their, uh, enterprise are the few pay pigs that are keeping them alive. I would never give the audience that much control over my enterprise because they trust me to provide the content. They trust my instincts and our instincts collectively. Easy Allies instincts are bad. That's why they go and they listen to the audience, or at least just a few members of the audience, mostly reset era, reject basement dwellers that have no control over anything that we do. And by blowback, the splash damage that Dustin got, I thought was unacceptable. And it mirrors what Brandon Jones, one of the founders and biggest names of Easy Allies, did to me in 2017. And what he did to me is very similar to what happened with Dustin. When he did Fireside Chats, my old podcast back with me after I left Kind of Funny, we had a great conversation. He came over, he shook my hand. He thanked me for helping him with Easy Allies so much when I was at Kind of Funny. Remember that I was a co-founder and leading charge of Kind of Funny, which was basically the example of making this kind of content work in in crowdfunding. What I've done is very influential and important, including the people like Easy Allies. And the first person that would say that is Brandon Jones because he said it to me. But when Brandon Jones went back to his crowd, most people liked what happened, except for a few people. They listened to a few people and he threw me under the bus on his Cup of Jones podcast. And I, I wrote him an email that fall and I was like, you are done. I'm done with you. Never talk to me again. Like, and that, that was where we left it. But you see, it goes into what I practice, what I preach, because knowing that Dustin is friends with Brad, knowing that Easy Allies are other people, knowing that my interactions with Brandon shouldn't paint the whole picture. Brad was welcome on Sacred Symbols Plus. Every single outside guest we have has someone that has a problem with it. David Jaffe, controversial when we have him on the show. Do I care? No. Would I ever throw him under the bus? No. Do I agree with everything that comes out of David Jaffe's mouth? Not even remotely do I agree with everything he says. (laughs) In fact, we are diametrically opposed on many topics. He also happens to be a brother and a good friend of mine. So you can have it both ways. The way they treated Dustin is not acceptable. And it and it rings with an echo of what Brandon did to me. The reality is, is that this game of telephone that has gone on long enough in this games industry about me and about this content, it needs to end. And I'm not entirely sure how to fight back about against it, except for to do a segment on our show and just kind of leave it there. This company, first of all, the company has no opinions because it's a company. The individuals within the company all have different opinions on things. And that's the way it's always going to be. And I am tired of the endless character assassination of me being a bigot and a transphobe and a racist. For what reason exactly? Tell me that. You point at obscure tweets. I, dude, I have recorded thousands and thousands of hours of content in my career. I have written millions of words. If I am so bad, you should have a tome of detail that will fill in all of the texture, but you have nothing except conjecture and misinterpretations and misreadings. And most of it, by the way, willful. And what you guys do is shameful because you do not care about the blowback and the splash damage on other people. You do not give a shit about it. 
And then you have the nerve to cast other people as the bad guy. I was reading that reset era thread. And one of the things that was funny to me was that someone said, like, all we need now is Colin to say something on Twitter and draw all of his people to it. See, this is the mentality people have is they can say and do whatever they want. And the second you acknowledge it or punch back, you are the problem. These people are despicable that do this kind of thing. And I mean that for most of the people at Easy Allies. So fuck you. And fuck you for what you said to Dustin. And what you did to him. How dare you treat someone like that? I'm sick of it. I am over it. It's not right. It's not fair. Stop swinging at us for any reason you want and using us as a punching bag and demeaning us. And um, look at how well we do with all of this defamation. Imagine if we were treated fairly, how big we'd be. It's, it's, it's a completely wild thing. And here's what I want to say specifically. I don't care what adults do. This is my personal opinion now, right? If, if it's not good enough for you to say, if you cannot deal with this, that I don't give a fuck what your gender, your race, your creed, your ethnicity, any of that is, if that's not good enough for you, too bad. Because I think and care about your gender and race as much as I think about my own, which is not at all. This obsession with race and gender, whatever, it's fucking lame. I do not participate in it. And if you can't, stand being around people that have differing opinions than you go into some fucking hug box somewhere and get out of here. What what are you even trying to do? Your content is worthless. If that's what you're trying to do, fucking worthless. And I want to say this too. If Brad's proximity to Dustin, whose proximity to me makes him bad, then what does that say about you who listen to both, both pieces of content? If you're a Patreon supporter of Last Stand and Easy Allies, understand how they feel about you. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you know I'm a, I'm a, I, I like to speak with my wallet, right? And I always tell you guys and encourage you to speak with your wallet. These people, the only reason they won't be even more honest with you about the way you feel is because they're failing already and they simply cannot afford it. But understand, you cannot wiggle your way out of that logic. If Dustin's proximity to me and the proximity to Brad makes that show bad, then you simply cannot be a Patreon supporter of both and get away with it in their eyes. That Mm -hmm. is sound, linear logic. And you do with that what you need to do with it. That's it. Is that okay with everyone? Chris, any thoughts? Uh, (laughs) Ah... Look, look, I'm going to be I'm going to be totally real. I only know a little bit about this and I'm going to go ahead and assume that. Uh, I, I, I can't imagine that I would feel any differently from you, so I, I, I don't want to add to it because I just don't I don't know much about easy allies at all uh, outside of like really, really old stuff that I, I think I might have listened to in like 2013 or something. You know what I mean? It's very old um, if they were even around. I don't even know. But. uh. I do feel like what they did to Dustin was really insane. Uh, and I feel like it's just blatant. It's just blatantly disrespectful. I, I don't like this notion of having to apologize to the audience for supplying them with content that is just ob- objectively interesting. Like, I think that's. And content just, they liked. Yeah. And know. content that the audience <laughs> like by a number. That's that's the thing that bothers me about this. Um I don't want to say culture because it's not a culture really, but this, this, this attitude that's kind of prevailing in this industry, the, the idea that you need to apologize for every single person that you interact with is just so insane. And it's just so antithetical to just being a living, breathing, thinking human being that I just don't even know who, I don't even know what your life looks like. If you, if you just don't inter- if you can only interact with people that you agree with hundred percent. And even if that is the case, like you have to imagine you have to imagine that these the, the divisions that are assumed to be there in the first place are are wildly overblown uh to even justify this kind of uh reaction and so i mean i i i co-sign everything that colin said um i think what they did to dustin was really fucked up and i think it's lame and uh i think brad deserves better based on 
uh, the information that I have seen. And uh, <laughs> it's just embarrassing, really, for, for them. Like, if I, I would ne- like f- never in a million, like there's I could I can imagine a number of reasons why I would apologize for certain content that I've that I've made. But like none of them would be about having somebody else on that the audience might not have appreciated them being on as much. And by the way, that wasn't even the case because <laughs> the audience liked Dusted. So it's it's all completely alien to me. None of this makes any sense. And uh, it seems to me that they really, that they just don't know how to, they just don't know how to run their business. Yeah, well, it's too late for them. And so it's time for us to, listen, like, that's why I said, like, some people are going to think what I had to say was mean, and it's like, too bad. You know, like, when you punch at me or one of my people, I have to punch back, and, and, it, and I'm just telling you the reality of the situation. And again, I just want to reiterate, really think carefully about why and how and if you're supporting them, because why would you? The, the, the linear logic, it, it speaks for itself. That's it. Either you think they're lying about it and just have a unique thing against us and you believe what they say and you have to act accordingly. Are you happy? Or are you unhappy with the, the, the response? I mean, what, how do you feel? I'm sure it's a little uncomfortable. You know? It's very but. uncomfortable um, since I'm very close with Brad. So yeah. um, and I know there are people there. Uh, I know that it's a mixed. Response. So I hate to see people get caught in the crossfire. Um, you didn't do anything but, wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. didn't do anything. You're showing so. more care, by the way. You're showing more care in this instance <laughs> than, they, than, than they did for you. The thing, too, is large. just that this I already made this clear, so I'm like repeating myself. But it's like the reason why I haven't said anything is because I've been talking and meeting with people trying to make a way to make this right first i didn't want it to be like this Uh, Um, yeah but i did everything that i could yeah it's it's uh it's one of those things where i know that our audience and most of their audience know there is no controversy but um even if it's not true it sucks to have a controversy around you you know so yes i appreciate it (laughs) 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 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're like dude this is the first time huh yeah that, that's exactly what I, like that's that's exactly what i thought too it's like that, that gif of uh, james franco in, in ballad of buster scruggs or whatever with the roof yeah. around his neck it's like first time first huh? time first time huh yep <laughs> all right let's get into the actual meat of the show now smaller news items i'd like to get through before we get to what we're playing then we'll get into a few bigger news items and we'll wrap it up with listener inquiries as we always do I wanted to start here, TrueTrophies.com, who we don't often cite, but they have an interesting little insight here into if PC trophies are coming for PlayStation games. And it's interesting, Chris, because you and I were just talking about this yeah. last week on the show, apropos of nothing, I think just, oh no, it wasn't apropos of nothing. Someone wrote in saying, would I care about PC trophies? And I was saying, I don't know exactly how that would work because would you have to have a launcher? Would you just kind of get replicate trophies when you move saves over or whatever? It's unclear how that would work, but Here's what True Trophies wrote in an exclusive new data suggests PlayStation PC trophies are in the works. And so they obviously scrape from the PlayStation Network to get their trophy data. And it said, quote, recently, one of True Trophies scanners, the very scanners that allow us to bring you up to date trophy lists directly from the PlayStation Network, picked up the new PS5 trophy list with an interesting additional platform alongside it, PSPC. The trophy list in question was simply titled Trophy Set and wasn't attached to any particular game, appearing to be a test of some kind. So. They show an image of it and it's just it shows it in their back end in their scraper what it would look like. So this is seems like a pretty obvious ode to them testing something out. And they have put up trophy sets in the past that are just dud trophy sets to test things out. I I can't remember the name of it, but there's a dud PS4 trophy list that I think came out before PS4 came out, which was for some fake shooter that never came out. People can go look that up if they want. So this might be that. I know this isn't very interesting to you, but it is interesting to us because I'm not entirely sure how this might work. So, Chris, since we talked about it last week. What do you make of PCPC being listed in the scanner platform for uh, true trophies? Does it mean we're getting PlayStation trophies on PC after all? And how do you think it will work? Yeah, I, well, first of all, I, I think it's just kind of wild that we 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 literally were just talking about this. 
<laughs> so it's very weird. It feels, it feels like it feels like we willed this into existence. But I do think, yeah, I mean, the, if PlayStation would be wise to get this kind of sorted out sooner rather than later because it is a big. It's clearly a big draw for a lot of people. Trophies do have like a, a really dedicated audience. I know. On I brought it up in that conversation last time that. Xbox, at least with certain games, I only really know Halo because it's the only one I dabble in 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 a multi platform capacity. I know that those achievements unlock based on just matching sets. So if you log into your Master Chief Collection on Steam or whatever, uh, all of my trophies from Xbox popped up. And if I got an achievement on Steam, it would it would then unlock on uh, Xbox when I would log in the next time. So ideally, that would be how it would work. It would give people an incentive, but at the same time. I don't know if there's a way because I know that you like to opt out of that sometimes, Colin, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you, to give yourself a an insane reason to do something over again. For, right. <laughs> but so maybe that's something that they're probably also trying to figure out, too, is a ways to opt out so it doesn't automatically sync. Uh, I, I don't I, it automatically does it for the Xbox. So I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a way to opt out of it. I don't care enough about achievements or not to know the ins and outs of that system, but they would be wise to get this uh, figured out sooner rather than later. And it seems like, I mean, PSPC is pretty clear as far as like the, the, the nomenclature of it. So I think this is a pretty good sign that, yeah, that we're probably going to get trophy support on, on at, at least PC games in general, whether or not that means like steam. That's a, another, I have no idea. Uh, we can hope that would be a, a really great, addition or a really great retroactive addition to uh, certain games that are already on steam. But as of right now, it's, it seems like at least they're working on it for PC generally, which is good. Yeah. What do you think of this, Dustin? Uh, uh, to me, I, I hope it works in some sort of, in some sort of loose way, similar to how I would feel about the mobile trophies. If we ever got those for the mobile games where right. you can earn them all in, a, in the same list so they don't sync them together so you can earn them again. I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, we don't know very much about it here, but I agree with Chris where this is pretty conclusive. I think. I think that it's it makes sense and it's strange at the same time, because on one hand, I think PlayStation seemingly doesn't care about trophies. They weirdly selectively care about trophies here and there. So in one hand, this is cool for people that are caring about trophies. They also play on PC. Maybe they see this as a gateway for PC players that maybe this is a way they could get into the ecosystem if they get them hooked on trophies same time i would imagine that any pc trophies will be very easily unlocked on the pc version kind of breaking it i don't remember exactly with steam but a lot of times you can do mods just unlock all trophies or or whatever steam achievements something like that so this may create a compromise in the system but the system has been compromised for many years. So it doesn't really uh, matter in that sense. So it's kind of across the board for me as far as strategy. But I think that overall, it's a good thing. And giving more incentive to PC players to be a part of the ecosystem as a whole. Yeah, well said. We'll keep an eye on this. I obviously will. Maybe I'll be playing. You know, I, I discovered something interesting about Dagan when we were doing the Spider-Man games. He's been playing most of his games on PC. Because he was saying that Miles Morales was the first game he played all the way through on PS5. And I was like, wait, what? Because we did Dead Space. We did Resident Evil. He's like, no, I played those on Steam. <laughs> He's like the last person in the world I would ever expect to play on PC that much. So yeah. He's becoming a PC nerd in some way. Does he have a beefy PC? I mean, I know he yeah, has he, I think stuff, he, so. I think he does because of the renders he has to do and stuff. Yeah. Oh, that makes um, perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Those, those rigs are crazy. Yeah. yeah. He no, really he's, nice he's set. He's set. All right, guys, I wanted to see what you thought of this. This is making the rounds, although not widely reported. Our friends over at Insider Gaming did write this up. It's titled Mysterious Soulsborne Game was just tested in London. It says, quote, it was just discovered that a recent playtest took place in London, assumedly for PlayStation UK, that involved a game for Soulsborne fans, but nobody has any clue what that game could have been. In the example provided on the now closed listing, games like Elden Ring, Bloodborne, Wolong, and Dark Souls were referenced. This four day playtest, which testers would receive 500 pounds, not a bad rate was taking place in Oxford Circus in central London, and it ran from the 10th to the 13th of October. Now gamers who have picked up on the news have started to wonder exactly what game was being tested. So in other words, Sony put out a plea for a focus test for a Soulsborne game. It just happened. People um, went and played this game for four days. Dustin, this has to be Rise of the Ronin, right? People are people are looking at this as being like, oh, maybe it's like Bloodborne. Uh, I'm like, I don't know. 
Rise of the Ronin is supposed to come out in a few months. So I would assume that they're getting people in for one last go before they go gold, probably by the end of the year or early next year. What do you think it is? Yeah, I think that Bloodborne 2 would be announced, I think, before they did any play tests because the leak potential on that is so high that I think that they would be smarter than that. So Rise of the Ronin, though, I think that as far as the timing does make way more sense. I'm curious about it being in London specifically, but uh, yeah, I think that I probably think... has to do with my assumption was X dev primarily works out of London now because they, they no longer work out of Santa Monica or Tokyo. Mm. So I would assume second party games are, are largely funneling through that team. And that would right. be the reason why. Yeah. The only other thing I could think of is I'm trying to think like, yeah, because they right here and it could be Blood Points, uh, Blood Point, Blue Points new game. Maybe if that's kind of in the Souls realm, we don't know anything about that. And that, I guess, could be a possibility. But Rise of the Ronin could be that, too. I think it's Rise of the Ronin. I'm pretty conclusive on that. I have no inside information. It just doesn't make I, it's exactly what you said. Why would you tease anything that was not announced? If that's way too risky and that doesn't often happen like there's no doubt that games like grand theft auto 6 are being play tested probably and focus tested but i can't even imagine the nd the nda you're under and i wouldn't want to fuck with them um yeah from you know not from experience but just knowing that they're very serious about things like they're one of the only rockstar is like one of the only studios that makes you sign an nda usually it's like a friend da or something where it's like kind of a wink and a nod but when we got red dead 2 i had to sign all sorts of shit so I so I don't want to say it's only for unannounced or only for announced games, but I think it's Rise of the Ronin. Chris, are you interested in this Rise of the Ronin game? Second party yeah. coming next year, Q1. So it would be about time that they would give it a go and see what people think. Yeah, I remember it was one of the few of these types of games that really caught my eye because it looked so action oriented uh, in a way that I, I didn't really get a feel for other games in the, in the, in the same way. Like specifically, there was a there was a scene where there was a scene specifically involving like a gun execution that I thought was so sick. <laughs> I thought it was like, this is so cool looking. And also I think there's like some weird paragliding mechanic in there too, which, which if I ever, if I had a doubt about like whether or not this was rise of the Ronin, it would only be the fact that I've not really seen souls born games or soul like souls like games involve that kind of traversal. Exactly. That would be the only thing, but like, I can't imagine what else this could possibly be. So if this is rise of the Ronin, it means it's at least, getting up there it's getting close and uh i'm looking forward to it this is like one of those rare second party games that i, that I have a, a minor obsession with for for some reason i'm trying to still kind of you know if there's if there's more trailers for it i'm probably gonna stay away just because i think it i think it looks neat and i'm already kind of sold on it but i'm excited for it yeah team ninja is interesting because they they work with everybody uh, everyone of course but they do PlayStation exclusives, of course, and Neo would be a couple and Neo 2 would be a couple examples of those kinds of games from Team Ninja. But then they did Wolong Long as mm -hmm. well. This is open world, apparently, which I don't think the other two are. Certainly Neo 1 isn't because I played Neo 1. But so there's going to be an interesting kind of angle that I think will be much more akin to something like Elden Ring. Although this game was in development long into when Elden Ring came out. So it's not like they could have been inspired by it. But I think it'll be more like that than it will be by Neo and since XDev, like I said, is it's a second party PlayStation published game. I think that that makes a lot of sense that it would go through London. I think back in the day, if this was five years ago, the playtest would have happened in Japan because there was still a, a healthy and hefty XDev um, second party publishing apparatus there, but not anymore. All right. Uh, I thought I saw or I thought I would bring this up. This came from our friends over at Video Games Chronicle. Shout out to them. We haven't um, used them as much as we usually do over these last few weeks, but they're always very useful. One of the great video game websites out there. They pointed to Bill Bill Coon, who is this prodigious Twitter leaker who somehow has a connection to back end PlayStation stuff because he always leaks PlayStation Plus games before they're announced, like with complete 100 percent accuracy. So no one really knows like where he's getting this stuff from. But he leaked the release date of the new PS5 Slim. So um, he, apparently, according to him, November 8th will be when the PS5 Slim Standard Edition comes. And then on the 10th, the standard and digital will be uh revealed so the standard comes with the drive the digital version comes without the drive for the various prices we discussed so if you're interested in that are either are any of you guys going to get another ps5 I, I have no need for one but i didn't know if you guys were interested in the new tech some people just like to get the new hardware revision right. i don't yeah. need one person i'm holding out i'm ps5 pro all the way oh yeah no i don't yeah. i don't need yeah. one this year next year though maybe oh yeah yeah that's that's kind of where i'm at too 
Yeah, I it, it's uh, I saw a video or I screenshot from a video. I didn't watch the video, I must say, but where they had a comparison, like a physical comparison of the two in, in real life, not like a render. And uh, it, it is smaller than you would think. Like it, mm. it, it doesn't seem quite it's skinny, I guess I should say. It's still tall. Right. But it definitely lost some of its heft, its volume, no doubt. And they reported that, of course. All right. So I wanted to read this. This came from deep within and Activision Blizzard games on Ubisoft Plus Primer that was written on Ubisoft's news outlet. So it's like a very weird thing to kind of be citing for our show. But there's something in here that I wanted to bring up. Um, the Ubisoft writer. So Ubisoft has a, a, an editorial staff. So I think Daniel O'Connor is the writer here. Um, and they're talking to a guy named Chris Early, who's Ubisoft's SVP of Strategic Partnerships and Business Development. They ask him about physical media. And I, you know, Dustin, I was especially thinking of you. I don't know if you saw this making the rounds or whatever, um, but I wanted to bring this up. He's asked this guy uh, from Ubisoft's news. He asks, what do you think of the physical, the, the future of physical media? And this guy answers, quote, there's a collector's edition market. There's an aspect of gift, gifting physical items and allowing access for people to play and to be able to easily purchase a game in a store and gift them to their friends or family. Some people always want to own physical discs. I just don't think it's going away. Do I think physical sales might get lower over time? Sure. But it will it completely go away. I don't think so. This is very, very interesting. We got a letter actually from William Jackson over on Patreon who wrote in on our newsfeed and said, hey, sacred crew, with Remedy electing to forego a physical release of Alan Wake 2, can we just take an honest to God minute and mourn the loss of physical games for just a moment? I know we here at Sacred Symbols, Sans Dustin, are ready to dance on the graves of those who enjoy physical games. I'm not ready to dance on your graves. I'm ready to yeah. dance on physical games grave, right? I don't want to <laughs> dance on your grave because you like physical games. That's not me. But what about the digital revolution is so appealing? I don't technically own the game. I can't shave some. Uh, I can't shave off some of the cost of trading it in, and I can't let friends borrow a digital license either. You can't even rent games anymore to try and beat them in a weekend or even sample the full game before deciding to buy. So you're telling me my only option is to purchase Alan Wake 2 for $60, beat it in probably under 20 hours, and then it just sits on my digital bookshelf uninstalled after I'm done with it forever? It's only a matter of time now before Sony and Microsoft do, do this with their first party games. I'd rather pay Microsoft and Sony $60 a month to subscribe to Game Pass and PS Plus and have access to hundreds of digital games than I have to shell out full pricing for games I can't do anything with after I complete them. William, I think you might be worrying about nothing because Dustin, I was curious what you think of this. I don't think this guy from Ubisoft will be saying this just out of nowhere. This idea that physical games will always remain. And my whole thing is, let's assume, so the new Xbox model is going to have no disc drive in it, no option for a disc drive. And that's different for them, I think, because they're pushing Game Pass in a much more digital ecosystem. But what is stopping PlayStation from just making up a spoke disc drive forever? That would just connect with a USB cable or something. It doesn't even have to be this elegant thing where it slides in. Eventually, maybe it'll just be like a the Xbox 360's HD DVD drive where it's just something that sits on the side if you want it. So seeing this from Ubisoft kind of gives me heart for people like you that they're probably never going to get rid of discs completely as long as the hardware manufacturers just make some sort of add on. Because I do think it's obvious that the PlayStation 6 will have no disk drive. I mean, that, that would be insane um, to, at that point to give it a disk drive. But to give you an option, how do you feel? Maybe you'll live forever. Yeah, well, I think that there's a perspective, too, that we are on, when a lot of people talk about physical games, they're only thinking from wherever they their current market is. And that was one of the big things in Japan is just seeing that uh, they are very much a physical market still to this day. Uh, I think that they're still primarily physical there. I think I saw numbers recently about that. So um, I, I think when. Ubisoft looks at this, they're not just thinking from a U.S. or Western perspective, even. And it is true, specifically, he mentions, uh, I think I turned off the link, but he mentions about physical, like uh, collector's editions and, and a very specialized market for that. He's right. It's going to go down. It already is to the point where tomorrow I'm going to Target. I'm going to buy Mario Wonder because it comes with a shadow box thing. I want that. But I was thinking... I don't know if they're going to have Spider-Man 2. Surely they will, because it's one of the biggest games of the year on the biggest platform of the year. But I have been wrong before when it comes to getting a day one physical games in store to the point where if you want even just a normal copy, you got to potentially you, you have to order it online to get it. Mm -hmm. Usually stores might get it within a few days after, but. I'm trying to think the one of the more recent releases that I went 
and uh, I just couldn't I couldn't get it at all. Oh, it was a uh, Armored Core. No, no copies in store at Target. Uh, I think GameStop sold their pre-orders and that's it. So it's it's definitely getting very close to the end. But I think there will like this this guy saying there will still be a market for it. I think, William, your uh, your fears are a little early to that degree. I think we've still got we still got some time left. William, you did say something, and Chris, I wanted to go f- to you for this, and you can check me if, if you want. He says, so you're telling me my only option is to purchase Alan Wake for t- t- Alan Wake 2 for $60, beat it in probably under 20 hours, and then it can just sit in my digital bookshelf uninstalled after I'm done with it forever? <gasps> what? Hopefully it's forever. $60 <laughs> for a 20-hour game? Wow. You know, yeah, that's what I'm telling you, by the yeah. way. <laughs> I mean, from my, from my perspective, that is exactly what I'm telling you. So the only difference for you is is the is the, the again, Dustin gets mad at me because this comes up constantly. But like, you can give it to people and sell it back and all that. I'm like, I just you that's that circle has got to be just the, shrinking the, like this. The thing to you me know? about that, and it's like it's obviously different people have different preferences. That's fine. But to me, I've always noticed that I have never regretted. So I've only ever regretted selling games <laughs> every time. If I look back at my entire history of like as, as somebody who's been like interested in video games, every game that I've traded into GameStop or sold or gave to a friend been like, hey, here, take this. I've always been like, damn, I wish I still had that. And the same the same thing extends, especially to consoles, like especially to consoles. There's something that's like, man, I regret giving my cousin my PSP and being like, ah, I don't play this anymore. Here, have it. (laughs) Because I really miss, I really miss the PSP to the point where like the whole sellback idea doesn't really, I don't know. That doesn't really entice me at all because I just understand. Bravo team on PSVR. (laughs) That's why you have no regrets. That was a game I immediately sold and I'm very thankful that I got most of my money back. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's fair, but it's also like it's one, it's one of those things too, where like um, even the even the worst games that I owned, it was just like I, I I had a hankering recently to play like Search and Destroy on PS2, which is this terrible, just terrible tank. It was like a tank game where you were you were like Lego tanks and you were going around fighting. And I, I remember I hated it when I was a kid. And I was like, oh damn, I wish I still had it because I want to make like a, a video on it, right? Or something like that. And so, and, and so to me, I, I understand that's specific. That's very specifically my use case uh, to the point where it, like it behooves me to just have access to everything I've ever played. So to me, digital is fine. But I don't know, man. I, I, I think I think I, I, I'm kind of in agreement with with Colin that like I, I, I just I have to, I can't imagine that digital like physical games will will just go away. I think they'll become more specialized and they'll probably be harder to not harder to find necessarily, but harder to find on foot because that's unfortunately just what's happening to everything. I mean, think about how often we rely on Amazon for things that we could have easily just gone to the store for. That's, uh, that's just kind of becoming the new normal um, for everything, not just games. That's everything that we have. So I I wouldn't, I don't know. I wouldn't get too doom and gloom about it. You know, we're going to have access to physical games for quite a long time. Yeah. I'm not worried about it either. This just hearing someone at a third party in a position of power give that kind of feeling says to me that they at least know or understand things that are beyond the the short to midterm that we understand about these new consoles. And just seeing the obvious thing about just making an external drive and yeah. making that an option. And yeah, that's it, it. And it, it will always I, I think it will evolve into like a like an old like a different way like the default i think will be digital because of just the the efficiency and the convenience of it but i do think there there's going to be enough people who are into physical media and and all that stuff even because for me even honestly this might sound crazy but like i i i still i stream a lot of media still but i will buy like 4k blu-rays still like if if it's if especially if it's of a movie that like i really like oh my god the thing this is sick um, and I'll buy it just to have it physically because I want to be able to watch that whenever and not have to rely on <laughs> internet for absolutely everything, but it is going to be a new baseline that we're, we're going to rely on more and more. So, um, I don't know, man, I, I, I hope physical media persists for a long time. I do like even as somebody who doesn't utilize it all that much, but I, I also think that's just what's going to happen too. I think we're going to have access to it for a long time. 
All right. Final piece of news I wanted to bring up really only has to do with us as of recently because Roblox finally came to PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 where it's doing really, really well. But I finally. thought this was interesting specifically to show you how much money and power and prestige these guys have. So <laughs> Roblox <laughs> Roblox employs 2,000 people. Jesus. And they've been working remotely completely. They, they're they based in San Mateo, which is in, um, in Silicon Valley towards the north end, right under San Francisco. Of course. And they're, they're ordering all their people to come back by the summer of next year. But here is what they'll do for you. Um, and I just thought I was like, this is wild, man. So employees who are asked to begin working from the office. So that's basically everyone with a rare exception. will have three months until January 16th, 2024 to make that decision. Employees who are not able to relocate will have an additional three months until April 15th to transition out of their roles as full time employees. Employees will continue to work during that time with no change to their compensation or vesting schedules. This means all employees, regardless of whether or not they chose to relocate, will receive both the November and February quarterly vestings in addition to any other vestings they have during that time. Employees who are departing Roblox will receive a severance package based on their individual level in terms of service, along with six months of healthcare coverage for everyone of their, on their policies. And then for employees who choose to relocate, we are asking them to begin working from our San Mateo offices by July 15th, and we will assist re with relocation costs. So hmm. pretty nice. Yeah. Nicely done mm -hmm. by Roblox. Got to give them a lot of uh, credit for that. I'm sure a lot of people appreciate that. Epic is doing a similar thing for a lot of their employees too, which is good. They just, it's not the short-term money they're worried about. It's like the long-term costs. So I'll be interested to see how many people choose to continue to work at Roblox. If they have vestings at, so wide that normal employees get them. So like everyone gets their quarterly vestings, like their, their profit sharing, it's gotta be a pretty lucrative place to work. I wouldn't want to yeah. leave. So I think that they're holding that over people's heads a little bit, which is good. I mean, that's fine with me. All right. That's all we have for the small pieces of news. Wanted to get into games we're playing. Dustin, you weren't here last week, so let's start with you and hear from you. Uh, yeah. What's been keeping you busy? Uh, so I finished Lies of P. I was trying to think because I was like, oh, yeah, I've got two weeks worth because I, I thought I hadn't played very much with me being gone and stuff. But finished Lies of P. And I got to say, pretty great. Uh, I, I liked it a good deal. And I recommend it. It's probably the best souls like there is and as you guys know i'm not into souls like games um i think that there are some things about the combat i still don't particularly like i made sure that i beat the whole game and beat the optional boss because i didn't want anyone to say i got filtered so there we go 100 percent, not 100 percent done but you know what i mean so i think that um gene and i are going to do a spoiler cast i don't know when but he just finished it and so we're going to get that going where we can go into one of the craziest post credit scenes I think I've ever seen. Do they set it up game. for a sequel? They set it up for something. <laughs> Let me tell you. Let cool. me tell I think I'll spoil it for myself. I'm going to go. Look I was going to say, I, you should you should look it up. The ending, the ending of Lies of P. Yeah. The post credits ending. Oh, post credits. Very, very good. Uh, Walt Disney is the, the oh is, yeah. the is the bad is the bad oh. guy. Interesting. Really? Stuff here, Colin. Uh huh. <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah, it's really really interesting what they're doing. Wow. That's, yeah. That's oh, a man, big I, spoiler. I'm surprised people haven't been spoiling that. I know. Or, I I was oh, surprised fuck. when I watched. I was like, how did I not know about that? Uh, I got to finish it now. <laughs> yeah, you do. It's, it's, that's pretty crazy. That's a pretty crazy ending. I'm not just saying that. That's very clever. Dude, I Gene texted me. He's like, dude, that's probably the best ending of the entire year. I was like, you might be right about that, dude. It's it's something. Ah, damn so, it. <laughs> all done with that. Back on my Baldur's Gate three bullshit. I'm in act three. There's some crazy shit happening. It's very, very difficult, but I, you guys have heard me talk about it a lot. I just want to know. It's still it's still ongoing. Did you I, fuck a bear I, yet? Did you fuck a bear yet? No, I could have. <laughs> I could have. Well, yeah, I, I could have, but I, ha I haven't fucked anybody yet. My guy's pretty like lonely right now. He's having a rough Ooh. time. I'm, cour I'm courting somebody. You know, I'm playing the long game. With You're Shadow courting Heart. somebody in act three. <laughs> can't can you like is, is that surely you can do no, you know, you know everybody, everybody goes at their own. Everybody goes at their it's own. It's hard pace. to be lucky in love, my friend. Much to the chagrin of that guy's girlfriend <laughs> that wrote in uh, a few weeks ago. You know, me and Shadowheart, we got a uh, we got something going on. Okay, just takes time. So that, and then lastly, I want to show you guys. I have a new toy that's gaming related. My analog pocket. 
so finally yeah, here. I saw the screenshots you put up online. It looks beautiful. Yeah. So what is this exactly? So what this is, is a very expensive, very nice Game Boy. And what's cool about it, this is where it gets really nerdy, is that this runs off of, and I'll try to explain it. I don't fully understand it, but I'll try. It runs off of FPGA technology. And that stands for like field programmable, pro, programmable. Okay, I'm just going to stop there. It stands for something. But what, what is it, it means is. What is it? Uh, FPGA. FPGA. Field programmable something. Field programmable array. gate array. Gate array. Okay. So the the idea behind it is that when you emulate something, you are emulating the hardware through software. Where when you use FPGA, it emulates the actual chip on a chip. So like it's it configures it in a way that when you have emulation, you know how sometimes all oh, the sounds slightly weird where there's like this glitch or whatever. No, no, no. This doesn't happen on this. This is when the, it is basically in all tense of purposes, purposes for when you play it, it is playing on a Game Boy. So mm. this will play Game Boy, Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance right out the, you know, right out the box. You can see I have uh, Super Mario Land 2, two. six gold yeah. coins. Fucking classic. It's been really fun. And dude, Love it's great. Games. Let me show you guys. Sorry, I'm sorry for the audio listeners, but it has these different palettes. So right now I have it in Game Boy Pocket mode. Um, but you oh, so you get the um, sharper. So you get the really sharp graphics. See yeah, yeah you there can, you go. Yeah, right, right. And you can and do it backlight. Uh, there's like a, a green mode for the DMG. Oh, now, oh. here's That's this cool. is where it gets again. Very, very nerdy. This is a 1440p screen. This tiny little screen. It's the the PPI, the, the pixels per inch is so dense that it emulates the space between the pixels of the individual Game Boys. So, it so is looks, it sharp? Is it like way sharper than? Oh, like, yeah. Is it like yeah, a, it looks uh, incredible. That's, that's I was crazy. looking at the screenshots you were sharing yesterday. I'm like, wow, man, because I know it, those games and it's like those look really, really great. <laughs> when, that's when that's you, interesting. When you, yeah. For Game Boy Color, if you look really close, it's emulating the individual pixels of a Game Boy Color. Like not the not the pixels, the sub pixels, like the red, blue, green. You can see my photo on Twitter. Uh, So, yeah, the other thing, too, is that it plays. You can download cores, what's called cores for it. So it'll play Super Nintendo Genesis. uh, It will run ROMs for Game Boy, Game Boy Advance. You can get adapters. So it plays Game Gear games. I bought the dock for it. So you can just plug it in your TV, have a wireless controller. So it's basically like an all in one portable device for playing retro games these guys are getting good man huh like i i think i mean they've been doing good for a while but making electronics is hard how'd you scale. get yeah. one of these you can't so That's anyone awesome. who's interested in this uh the only way to get one is on ebay right now because these sold out in three minutes that's amazing man yeah they yeah. can only make so many of them probably yeah well i think that they are they are a controversial company because they they announce drops and it's very much you got to be there to get it. It's like designer clothes, like for yeah, yeah. retro gaming, which people don't like. And I get that. But if you're there when it's available and you're willing to spend two hundred and fifty dollars on a Game Boy. That's well spent, I think. Well, yeah, that's I think the so thing. Too, yeah. Just for the emulation. Wait. I mean, not even putting the games in. If you can just run emulators on it, why wouldn't you just get that for two hundred? Yeah. Well, that's the thing is that you can yeah. you can get an emulator or a handheld emulator thing that's way 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 cheaper but people who buy analog stuff know that you're it's not about the value it's about the premium quality and this yeah, thing has the build quality insane. on it is it is it like does it feel good to hold and and all that oh yeah i was a little concerned since this is the see-through blue color that the plastic might not feel as nice but it it's amazing it, it just realized fantastic. i yawned oh my god i'm sorry Whoa, oh man! Hey, oh, oh. oh, we're gonna have to crucify Colin. Oh, nice. <laughs> we know how he feels about yawns. Uh, I, I had to own it. I had to own it. Um, I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, it's okay. And I wasn't so, yeah, was trying thing. to be rude about what you were saying. I just was remarking that, like, wow, I yawned. I didn't even think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's very cool. I would I would say I recommend it if you are genuinely interested in these analog. In the past, when they've done so, they've done like a Super Nintendo and a Genesis and all kinds of stuff. They've done multiple runs where they release them. And for those old ones, they've said this is the final run when they do mm. the final one. They have not said that yet about the analog pocket. So 
I believe there will be another chance before you go and scalp one or buy a scalped one online. How much are the scalped ones? It's a good question. I saw a thing that potentially the market on them is starting to die out because they brand new seal 250 really on, e- on, on ebay right now okay so maybe maybe not so bad for a used one or for a new one uh this says brand new sealed analog pocket uh oh wait it's, oh, it says dock oh okay, the so that dock. makes sense that makes sense yeah the dock is another hundred bucks let me see let me see which is insane uh, so the dock is 250 marked up um uh, analog pocket this is yeah cool, i man. uh i love it i love i love the idea of keep making new hardware that i yeah. don't know how they get away with it i'm sure that there's some legal stuff and, and again it's not not it's not the emulation that is illegal i don't think anyway it's the roms themselves that are illegal like making the environment making an nes environment and emulating it is not illegal it's like it's using ROMs of licensed games that would be legal. Yeah. illegal. so so what right. i'm seeing right now is is 370 350 so like 100 something yeah um that's not yeah. honestly dude that's <laughs> i don't it's know not too bad that's not, it's not as bad I, as it was. How about that? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, fair. I'm Paul, gonna pick one of these up. This is sick. Dagan told me you own an analog product. You have the Noir NT that you guys got for doing knockback NES Let's Plays. Oh right, yeah. Dagan has that. Yeah. Oh okay. I was gonna steal it from you since I knew you would never use it. But yeah, uh, Dagan, Dagan will, will use it. So yeah, Dagan has. Thing- I was thinking about Dagan's setup, like where you know, in his office, because I know what his office looks like, where his background is, kind of, it's his closet, and this is the way his stuff is organized. But I'm like, it would be cool if he reorganized everything, because Dagan has an asinine amount of video games, like yeah. old games in his in his office. Most of them are put away, I think, still, but just shelves of Famicom games, and like old Genesis games and all sorts of things would be cool to see. So yeah, this would be much more up his alley. I just, the reality is twofold, maybe even manifold. Like the, the first thing is, is that a lot of these games are available on newer hardware or whatever. So like the Castlevania games, I can play on PS4 now from Game Boy or whatever and the NES or whatever. But the second thing is, is that I don't really have a problem with emulating old, really old platforms, generally speaking, just because they're so old. No one's really making money off of them anymore. I mean, it's technically illegal and I don't actually do it. I haven't really emulated games actually in probably close to 15 years. The PSP was my beast of an emulator oh, yeah. emulating machine. But um, and I've never emulated anything newer than an SNES or a Genesis either. But. It's funny. I was emulating SNES and Genesis games in the 90s, and then I was emulating them 20 years later, and I just never moved on from there. So it's not that I have a real moralistic reason with going, not having emulators for those old games. It's just they're, a lot of them are so playable now, so I don't necessarily need that. But for people like you that have all the old uh, software, it'll be great. Yeah, and that, so that, that accepts Game Boy slash Game Boy Color. Oh, yeah. Nice. And advanced. So this is the Super Nintendo core yeah, that's Super running on it. Yeah. So I have Super Castlevania on here, and you can just play that. It holds your saves. Pop it in the dock. You can play with a wireless controller. Dude, take it with you. Simon's animation in that is so funny. If you just hold the weight the- down and he just, like, oh yeah, he just like yeah. his arm just goes all crazy. <laughs> Fucking, I was just when I got that game. I got, I got that game for Christmas when I was in like third or fourth grade. I was like hysterical. All right, um, that's everything for you, I guess. Oh, by the way, Liza P, a million sold. So not too that, bad. Yeah. One of the things I talked to on Sacred Symbols Plus with the Atari producer was we were talking about Game Pass and and little things like that. And I was like, do you think that they let's say they would have sold 1.4 million or something if it wasn't on game pass do you think that that would be more gross revenue than what they got paid we had a pretty interesting conversation about that in other words Mm. if it's like free marketing and all the rest but i think they're very happy taking both the lump sum and selling a million plus good for them all right chris let's talk to you my friend says here you're playing sea of stars and cyberpunk anything new to add yeah so i mean i'm i'm working my way through these slowly i'm i'm it's hard for it's hard to talk about cyberpunk <laughs> because it's so like this DLC is so story oriented. So I, I don't want to spoil it for people. But the story so far is like so, so good. I, I think I've reached like a pivotal turning point. I think I'm basically at the end. But man, it, the mission design and everything, everything that they've added, just the just from build quality stuff is just like it's so good. And I, I've been saying that for a while. So there's nothing really new to add. But I have. I have been playing Sea of Stars. I'm about 10 hours in, which is longer than I anticipated <laughs> uh, playing it for sure. I just uh, I just got to a, uh, a, a mid. I, I, I just got to a point where it seemed like it was going to end. 
and oh, uh man. it's and so i'm i'm continuing on with it i i i'm really into it man like i i i, I like sea stars a lot and what what i'm learning about myself as as i play this and i i talked about this last time but dustin wasn't here is that like dude i love this the real time elements in this like the fact that it's not just passive turn based combats and the fact that i can actually like impact how i do by act- by getting button button presses at the right time and and I'm rewarded for it. It's like it's like a mix of reflex and strategy, and I love that. Uh, but I, I think I'm going to see it through. Uh, it's an, it's a pretty easy game to juggle, thankfully, because um, I could just easily so, something about 2D games just feels really easy to juggle. Especially like I, I can play Spider Man and see a stars easy, you know, or even see a stars and Cyberpunk and Spider Man at the same time. It's like that's all really really doable for me. Uh, and I didn't write this in because I I spent so little time with it, but out of out of just sheer boredom one night i was like i didn't feel like playing anything i turned on castlevania symphony of the night and i was i was running through symphony of the night and i got a little bit far and then i died and then i got i got sent back to the beginning i was like i'm not i'm not doing I'm not wait doing, why I'm did not you doing, save i'm not doing this right now i just totally forgot i just like it wasn't in my head to save because so many <laughs> so many games save for me now that i was just like oh fuck uh i'll get, I'll get back to this later but uh but i, I do want to get into because I never actually finished Symphony. Though. I God, played like a cool. hell of, I played a hell of a lot of it when I was like a kid. That game is, so but cool. I, I never actually beat it. So it is kind of just sitting in my, in my backlog, just kind of waiting for me to finish it. So that's probably going to be something I tie. Once I'm done with Sea of Stars and once I'm done with Cyberpunk and Spider Man, I'm gonna. I, I, I can already tell I'm gonna breeze through Spider Man because that's one of those games that I just like to mainline. Yeah, it's short. But, I think you could probably do it in like ten to fifteen hours. I would assume. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. I, I want to get. I want to get it done soon, but. I think I'm going to tackle Symphony of the Night. Oh, my this. God, dude. That game is extraordinarily good. I mean, yeah, I can hear the music in my head right now. I think graphically, it's one of the most beautiful games ever. It, it's, yeah, it's really stunning how beautiful it's, it is. It's a it's a good looking. It's a good. Looking, was it was it you guys that sent me the <laughs> the Castlevania Dracula flow? Oh, yeah, I, I saw that, yeah. but I don't know. Yeah. Did, so did one of us send that to you? Maybe <laughs> I can't remember. Someone said that to me, but and it seemed like it would be one. It, it, it seemed <laughs> like it would be you if yeah, I was it thinking does, about it, it, because it's like, who the, who the fuck else would send me Dracula flow Castlevania stuff? But I try to be more deliberate with the things. I, I mean, I'm generally this way, but probably half the time I'm, I, I, I'm like, oh, I should send this to someone. I just don't do it because it's like, ah, oh, they don't. It's not that good. Yeah. yeah. Every now and I again, try- I'll find something like like a like a. A, d- a disabled looking Mega Man holding a gun right, that I thought was right. like really I was like I have to send this to Colin. dude I loved the image you shared of um, and the sacred symbols the right of Colin gave your image a thumbs down or something like that or dis- oh yeah disliked your image or something like that I was like that is hysterical that made me laugh actually yeah I had the foresight to screen to screenshot my because <laughs> it just looked it looked so funny Colin Moriarty sacred symbols Colin disliked an image <laughs> <laughs> all right for me I'll leave most of this to Sacred Symbols Plus, but I got through all of Spider-Man, The City That Never Sleeps, so the three-part expansion that came with 2018, or alongside, kind of a couple months after, um, a month apart, launched in three waves, the DLC from 2018 Spider-Man, and I really liked it a lot. I was interested in reading some of the critical reception of it and how people didn't really like it. I do think that it was fun to play one after the other. I imagine it was probably not as good if you were playing them and reviewing them two hours at a time. I wouldn't want to play that way either. So I liked that and that yeah. was cool. And that led me into Miles Morales, which I played and beat on PS4. I have to say, Chris, you do notice a difference between 30 and 60, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be either, which makes me wonder if I should just go play like a game like Gotham Knights at some point and get it over with. But um, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, well, a lot of that is due to just it's more than just frame rate. A lot of it is frame pacing as well. Like there are certain games that are 30 frames that feel really good because it's consistently 30 frames and there's like a solid pacing between those frames. But then there are other games that are 30 frames that are just really not optimized well, and you can really feel it. Um, so it's, it's not so much that 30 is unplayable. It's that most games that are 30 aren't 30 in a way that feels good right right i would imagine that insomniacs got that on on lock because i remember even toying around with the uh ray tracing mode or not the was it was it the there was like a a quality a quality mode i think is what it was called when you have like ray tracing on and it's like highest resolution but you sacrifice frame rate yeah i don't know i'm not sure because quality to me <laughs> quality is, to me means high frame rate. right exactly <laughs> so, like, so it's like a weird nomenclature but I remember even toying around with it on 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 Miles Morales and being like, you know, this yeah, this is 
30 frames is fine. I'm still going to choose 60 because good Lord, uh, it's just kind of, it's just better, but yeah, I, I don't remember any insomniac game feeling particularly rough on 30. Um, yeah, it was, I thought it was going to be more rough because of going into it from playing 60 for so long from mm, yeah. Spider-Man on PS5 and then because I'm playing it on PS4 specifically just so I can earn the trophies again, which has fun, been fun actually for me. The only thing that really bumps me out of the load times and I was talking to Dagan about how I've been playing it a little differently and that if something is 500 meters or closer to me, I'm just like, eh, it's not even worth it at that point to the quick time travel. Just go and go to it yourself. But I got through the game. It's really fun. And actually, Stefan S wrote in. This is something Dagan and I were talking about on the show as well. He says, hello, smoke and symbiotes. Spider-Man is he Spider-Man is here. Or Spider-Man, he says, because I guess you can play as both of them. I'm super psyched and I'm avoiding coverage as much as reasonably possible. But I noticed something early in the marketing. You would probably need to have played Miles Morales to understand some some aspects of the sequel. This got me to thinking, how many people do you think played Miles Morales? They seem to have combined the sales numbers from the main game and Miles at 33 million. What do you think the split is? Three to one is my guess. Thanks. And keep biting the fart bubbles in the bath. I don't know what the fuck that means. <laughs> You're not a real dra- fan. That's a Dracula. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. You're exposed. I know. I'm, I'm, I, I've <laughs> never claimed to be a real fan of, of, of I think it's funny, but I don't know it so No, deeply. yes, he is. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he, he, he has a, a tattoo of Dracula flow on his back. Yeah, I'm, a fucking, I'm like one of the little kids that are wearing like Nirvana shirts. There's like a, did you see the video of like a teacher <laughs> in the middle school kind of busting the balls of the students in the hallway and every time someone with a band shirt would come up, he would ask them to name one song from the band and it was just, that's it was awesome hysterical. it was like acdc or whatever nirvana i had the Beatles. same i had the same thing dude i had i had shirts from like i had a tool shirt just because like i had one like i don't even know who the who the fuck shirt it was it was like, like somebody had a tool shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it was like and somebody was like oh you like tool i was like what are you talking about <laughs> i don't you know what it was a tool, you thought it was a tool time show for, or a shirt from home improvement so you bought i it. really did like i thought it was so like i thought it was just such a stupid looking shirt like it's just like his tool i guess the whole point was that they would have like we're gonna have a band called tool that way people wear shirts that say tool on them and isn't that lame i think it was like the whole point but i just had it and i had no concept that it was a band i thought it was like some weird clothing company that didn't make it <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it was i remember being confused when i was a kid because i'm a huge stone temple pilots fan one of my very favorite bands and right, right. stp is also like that it's like a motor sport or motor oil or so it's like something to do with cars and it has that famous like blue and red ov- ovular logo. But then mm, STP yeah. started selling that as STP shirts. And I'm like, so I, I see it. I'm like, I don't know which one is like which anymore. Like, yeah, is this the company or is this the band? They kind of fused in the one. But um, as far as Miles is concerned, Stefan, I agree with you. And, and guys, this was something I was reflecting on and what I wanted to say, although by the time people hear this, it may be too late, <laughs> is that you really should play the DLC in Miles Morales if you haven't. I was actually surprised by how much story the DLC has that sets up Miles Morales, which I didn't have kind of like their interstitial period. Miles Morales begins a year after Spider-Man 1, 2018, but the DLC takes place in the months after the DLC when Miles is still like a a student only and kind of getting to know Peter and all of that. And I think that that was kind of relevant, a lot of exposition there. So Dagan and I were reflecting that though this is called Spider-Man 2, it's really kind of like Spider-Man 4 because you really should play all that stuff. And I wonder if they've made that clear enough to people because people going from Spider-Man one to Spider-Man two are missing a ton of exposition and story that I think is really important. Um, So I highly recommend it. And I think miles is just such a tight game. It's just really, really well done. We were reflecting Mm -hmm. on just all the, they got rid of all the science experiments. They, they, they had slow pacing, but like it was playing as miles and very story heavy. Like there's a a scene in the beginning when you're in his apartment and you're exploring it and it's fucking dope going through your dad's records. Very, very PlayStation, almost very naughty dog. But then they interrupt it with some stupid gameplay where you have to go like up to a rooftop to put the power back on and not get seen as miles. I'm like, oh my God, but it was good. It was fun to play it again. I really liked the story. Dagan and I were also reflecting on and we were using Persona as kind of a touchstone of like, why are stories of high school kids so interesting? And it just for me, I, I'm sure it isn't for everyone, but and it's not always, obviously, but it is interesting. And I don't really know why that is. I think there's something about the longing of going back to that age and the youth and the, the mm-hmm. inexperience and the, the naivete and. So, yeah, I really, really and I like the character of Miles Morales a lot. Like, I like that character. I like his hot mom. I like um his friend Genki I like all the rest I, I think it's really great so I'm ex- I'm really excited with, about the second one and Kazan Risk wrote in and said hey sacred crew Colin I'd like to thank you this week for being the military man taking the arrows to the back protecting me and other fans who are sleeping peacefully in our beds 
as people write in with Spider-Man 2 spoilers. Whether those spoilers are from leaks or Sony's overly revealing launch trailer, cheers and take care. We're almost to Spidey greatness. One of the unfortunate things is I saw. So I don't know if you guys noticed this. You know, people like put spoilers in Twitter threads or responses and you read it and then you don't really know what you're reading. And then but for some reason, this image was going around that had this Venom logo on it that had like all of the things written out. And it was a sign to me to like, oh, stop reading. In other words, I would have spoiled the game much more deeply for myself if they just were a little more regular, but they had to actually make an image to try to spoil it for people. And it was actually the harbinger of like, oh, don't look here. So I, I avoided so far most of the spoilers. I did see yeah. one spoiler in a fucking comment on a YouTube video, not even one of ours. I was like, come on, man. Yeah. You know? um, but I don't know that I really give a shit. And, and yeah, it's it's yeah, it's also Spider-Man. So it's like, right. That's exactly what I was going to say. The, 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 the thing about it is like, I know they're they're doing different things, but I mean, look, man, we, we know what I, I, I can't. I'll put it this way. I can't imagine that this game is going to narratively surprise me. Like, I, I would be more than happy for that to happen. But I just I can't imagine that that would be the case. I've I've seen the symbiote Spider-Man story play out a, a myriad of ways to the point where I've imagined pro- possibly like every every single version of this story possible so i think we largely know what we're getting into which is not a bad thing but uh i I, i've somehow managed to avoid significant spoilers anyway um but i'm excited i'm I'm super stoked the uh, i did see one spoiler uh, you did yeah Mm. it was uh because my on my for you page apparently spider-man gets a colonoscopy but it's yeah it's it was like xbox you know those (laughs) toxic trolls about xbox just posting that's so spoilers. lame it's like wow we're hitting a new low here again the spoiler i saw i really don't give a fuck it yeah. was mainly that someone was out to do that that i thought right the, the, the act of loser the act of going out of your way to to spoil something even if it's mild that you know it's i don't know man that's such an insane brain to have like i i would love to like occupy the mindset of that person for just like an hour just to see like what the hell <laughs> what the hell is going on that you feel that you feel like this is something that you have to do or, or that's something that it gives you joy to do like it's it's very bizarre to me over um, your console preference in the yeah. name of phil spencer come I, on i saw one i saw one spoiler <laughs> actually looking back at it so there's one spoiler where there's a there's a sequence in spider-man 2 apparently where uh, Peter Parker gets a colonoscopy, and you have to oh. you have to you have to wiggle the camera. Oh, up 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 through his ass. Use the analog sticks. Yeah, yeah. Until yeah. the lines <laughs> turn green. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that was like a bummer. I really would have loved to have been to have been nope, taken no, surprise. The pun. <laughs> <laughs> Calling it a bummer. Love it. It was a bummer, literally and figuratively. But I think you know. There are certain games I do care about being spoiled, and I was the Wojak with the 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 crying face, but then a mask of a happy face over it when I was reading all of the Last of Us two spoilers and getting rid of them so that people wouldn't see them. Yeah. And that did bum me out. And it's my hope that it would be cool for some of these publishers, especially a publisher like Sony with one of their bigger games. Not maybe I mean this Spider Man's huge sales wise, of course, but something like The Last of Us Part Three, imagine where it's like this game, we're simply not releasing it until to anyone until it's out. You can even imagine something like that with GTA six, a game where we simply do not need you to do it. Like we don't need the reviews. We don't need the marketing. We don't need the previews. We don't need any of it. Dude, there was another GTA uh, leak that I saw apparently, or I don't know if it's true or not, but like I saw like a bit, like I think in the last day or two, there was like some more, it probably wasn't all that interesting. It was probably like code or something, but that game is leaking like crazy. I don't know what the hell's going on. I think it's going to be around this time next year. I think it's going to come out. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're right. And just imagine what that's going to do to every other game in the two month vicinity around it. Let's say two weeks before it and six weeks after it's just going to fuck it up completely. But that would be an all. I mean, I don't want these companies to be secretive. It's just I would love to see one of them say, like, dude, you just simply don't get your hands on the game at all. There's we don't we can. What could Rockstar glean from letting Kotaku and IGN play Grand Theft Auto 6? Seriously. Yeah. All, all you do is open yourself up to risk. It's, it reminds me of when I saw GTA five in previews, I got so much heat, but I was like, this game isn't particularly that pretty. I, everyone's saying it's like the most beautiful thing ever, but I'm like, I think it looks fine. And just that got me a bunch of yeah. heat, but it also like opened up this whole can of worms where re- you really should have just not let me play it at all. Like, what did you gain <laughs> from letting me play? It? Yeah. And, and I think that that's especially true today. That'll be 11 years later. 
the internet has changed wildly even since then. And uh, I don't think you have to do the secret Half-Life 3 out of nowhere drop. But I do think you just say like the date is X and that's when everyone will play it. And until then, it's not going to be available to anybody. And I really hope they do that with The Last of Us Part 3 specifically. I hope they're smart enough to know that if they put The Last of Us Part 3 in people's hands before it comes out, it will be spoiled. And the spoilers in that one, which will probably be the last game. Don't make don't ups, don't upset me. I'm already upset enough. Don't upset me even more. <laughs> All right, my friends, let's get into the news. There's only a few items this week, and actually one of them is about PlayStation's primary competitor, but we can finally put this topic to rest. This happened right after we recorded Chris and I last week without Dustin, and so it would be weird not to acknowledge this and add it for the record, the sacred symbols record that it is finally over after about two years, 21 months, I think, actually. Number one. <sighs> The deed is done. Sony rival Microsoft has completed its acquisition of mega publisher Activision Blizzard, an ordeal that took nearly two years from announcement to signing. In a post on the official Xbox website, Xbox Wire, Xbox brand CEO Phil Spencer celebrated the acquisition with a cheerful letter and noted at the end of the following, in part relevant to the show's audience, quote, for the millions of fans that uh, that love Activision Blizzard and King Games, we want you to know that today is a good day to play. You are the heart and soul of these franchises, and we are honored to have you as part of our community. Whether you play on Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, PC, or mobile, you are welcome here and will remain welcome, even if Xbox isn't where you play your favorite franchise, end quote. Meanwhile, on the Activision side, there was also elation. Embattled longtime Activision CEO Bobby Kotick wrote to his employees in a memo in part that he will remain as brand CEO through the calendar year. What the plan is beyond that is unknown. With some 17,000 employees spread around the world, Activision Blizzard is amongst the biggest gaming entities in the world, and indeed, that number dwarfs PlayStation's development and publishing arms alone meaning Microsoft is about to ingest a ton of talent along with the studios and IP bundled from the various brands. Brands now in Xbox's hands include Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, Overwatch, Diablo, Prototype, Candy Crush, Guitar Hero, Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, and others. But the biggest of the bunch is obviously Call of Duty, the annualized behemoth that dominates sales charts each and every year. And while we know Call of Duty will stay on PlayStation, it's unclear what the plans may be for other products to come out of the APK ecosystem. Along with those games, the following studios are now brought into the Xbox Fold, though, like with Bethesda and its teams, they will remain siloed. Infinity Ward, Treyarch, Raven, Sledgehammer, Beanox, High Moon, and Toys for Bob, not to mention Blizzard and King. So we can finally put the saga to rest once and for all and see how it works out for Xbox. For their part, they've promised complete parity between Xbox and PlayStation for Call of Duty, with Spencer saying on an Xbox podcast in part, quote, we have no goal of somehow using Call of Duty to get you to buy an Xbox console, end quote. That means no more exclusive betas, gears, perk, gear perks, and so on. This is especially funny because PlayStation has an exclusive beta this year. Perhaps the most interesting quandary now, though, is keeping the talent at these teams in place long term. This is especially on the mind because Pete Hines, longtime marketing guru at Bethesda, left his post after 24 years, almost certainly fully vested following the acquisition and ready to move on. I couldn't believe he left. And that, that's I'm going to talk about that in a little while because I'm a little bit I have a little bit of a conspiracy theory about this, but we'll see. Um, so it, anyway, it's done. It's all over now. What mm. think, let's go around the horn, Dustin comments as we reflect on the acquisition and we move forward with this no longer being an unknown news item. Yeah. Uh, so I'm glad it's over. Obviously, it, it it feels good from from that perspective. I still feel like Phil would just be better to not say certain things. He can be celebratory and acknowledge continuing to make cross gen games without saying things like, let's read this again. Uh, You are the heart and soul of these franchises. We are honored to have you as part of our community. Whether you play on Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, PC, or mobile, you're welcome here and will remain welcome even if Xbox isn't where you play your favorite franchise. Okay, where does that apply and where doesn't it? Because right now there's all those, you know, the leaks or documents, whatever, about the next Elder Scrolls being exclusive. It's like, okay, well... Again, this is what I said before, and it just I'm just pointing it out. I don't care. I was always going to play Elder Scrolls on PC, just like I played Starfield on PC and all Bethesda games, because before I didn't have a nice PC to play those games on those platforms. So it really does not matter to me personally. I am just pointing out that Phil Spencer cannot resist saying shit like this and totally do something else. Uh, It would just be easier if he just was like, we're going to keep key franchises uh multi-platform but instead he kind of does this blanket statement where i'm like no 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 you don't get to have it both ways in this lion situation phil. lion phil <laughs> exactly 
<laughs> we said Brian, that was the meme before, but he keeps doing this. What would be fib? What would be fib and Phil? Fib and Phil. Fib and Phil. Okay, yeah, yeah. a little alliteration. Yeah. I appreciate that. I respect yeah. that. Okay, so that's an interesting place to start. Chris, how are you feeling now that we can reflect? It's behind us. So yeah, thank God, thank God, it's over. Um, I don't know, man. I, I'm I'm just glad it's it's behind us now. And you know, I think I don't know, man. My, my opportunity's knocking. Maybe this is the, re- the a- ample time period now for the return of the king. Prototype three oh, man. on the horizon. Yeah. I think, I think, I think there's a pretty good shot. back it. radical see, entertainment from the see, grave. <laughs> yeah. They're just like, by the way, also <laughs> radical. Did, did you see that the, the top, the top comment on, I think uh, on the Xbox accounts, uh, vi- video of like, Oh, the ABK deal is, is, is finally through is, is it's, Oh, does this mean we're going to get a new prototype? The top comment, by the way. So, man, there's a hunger, oh, man. There's a hunger. Yeah. We, we, we want, we want our, so. uh, we want our prototype in brackets, all caps. Yeah, exactly. That was the, that was the era, the late aughts, early teens. That was the, the type, like the typeface was, it's all about the typeface. Infamous. Same yeah. thing. Same era. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So here's where I stand on this is I'm glad it's done. We don't have to talk about it anymore. I do wonder, to your point, Dustin, how does the business realities of it work out? And I do wonder how they can withstand having this many teams. One of the things that I'm, I guess is peculiar about this to me is because people just don't seem to make this connection, at least from what I can tell, is like, everyone's like, okay, so now act, act, they can do all sorts of new things in revivals. And I'm like, okay, but how? Right. Like the, the apparatus, ex- no one's just doing nothing. Everyone's working on a project right now. Most of them are working on Call of Duty. So my whole thing is, is it more valuable to say that you can kind of give these IPs to other teams outside of Activision, which is what I would soon happen. In other words, people being like, oh, now these guys can make crash and inspire. And I'm like, I don't I just don't see how that works. You already have teams. Everyone's doing something. And if you interrupt any of the Call of Duty flow, then you just don't get Call of Duty anymore. So you can't really fuck with it. It totally it's like a Call of Duty has been like a black hole. Remember, it used to be one team. That would do a Call of Duty game. One team, just one team with obviously contract work and stuff and outside. But then it became two teams and then three teams and then four teams and then five teams. And then basically the entire family of developers making Call of Duty and being kind of subservient to it. So that's my one major confusion about it is, yeah, it's cool that these possibilities happen. But what do you cut, I guess, is what I'm saying. Or what do you add? You would need because you need way more team, thousands more people if you want to do these games. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if it's almost like a... If there's almost this philosophy of like, well, now we have all this IP instead of necessarily relying on Activision Studios to do that, because obviously they need those studios to keep Call of Duty running. It's like, well, maybe this frees up our internal studios to do because, I mean, they have. They've kind of done this already with their own internal IP with with uh, Playground touching Fable now, and then they're they're messing around in that wheelhouse, which they haven't really messed around. And it'd be interesting to see like one of I, I wouldn't I don't know Xbox Studios necessarily all that well to to denote like who should go where, but the idea of, you know, certain Activision properties being handed off to certain original Xbox internal studios might be interesting. And that might be something that they've kicked around. But I, I do agree with you. Like the, the idea that we're suddenly going to get this influx of uh, old IP kind of re- refreshed all of a sudden, just because just because they're owned by Xbox is a bit, it's a bit wishful thinking. Um, in a way that's probably not super realistic. I do think you're going to see at least one example of that, but like the idea of like, oh, we're going to get Crash and Spyro and they, they, we still don't even have a Banjo-Kazooie and they've had that forever. Yeah. It, Which to me is like, that to me is like an obvious one because I feel like that, like a Banjo-Kazooie game can't be that expensive. It's going, like even if it was just, I feel like you can make a, a Banjo-Kazooie game at Xbox like game studios for relatively cheap and sell it for a lot. Like, like a lot of people would be down for that, especially if it just looked the part and played the part and was just a proper little nostalgic bump, but they haven't done that. And that seems like a, that seems like a layup to me. Um, so that's the big concern is like, well, they haven't done this for, for an IP that they've owned for a long time. Why would they then dig up <laughs> crash bandicoot or, or Spyro and do something worthwhile with him? I don't know. Yeah, it, it, I agree with you that there will be one or two big ones. They have to do something like that, a big pop. And that's going to take time, years for them to do that. But yeah, to me, I just I'm skeptical of that 
because I just think it costs too much. I mean, if you take, on the other hand, if you take Phil Spencer at his word in his emails and his private correspondence as outed in various discovery, which I do take him at his word, he did say that Xbox has never closed the studio because of money. And so if that is in fact the case and continues to be the case and they only close them for creative reasons or personnel reasons, then you can imagine that there might not be that much pressure for these teams to necessarily deliver the way they used to. And maybe that gives them space and time to make these games. But I don't know. I I actually think Patrick Burkhardt here who wrote in has an interesting piece of insight, too, that I think will allow us to expand this conversation. He says, hey, guys, I just wanted to comment on the kind of crazy fervor since the Activision deal went through. I've seen an immediate desire to cross everything over for Xbox to make their own Smash Brothers, etc. Even coming from people like friend of the show, Jez Corden and others, along with people starting to speculate on who they can buy next. How did we get here? If you look at the ratio of developers that Xbox has on all of their teams, the original Xbox studios only make up less than 20% of what Microsoft now owns. This includes all of the teams they bought a couple of years before Bethesda. The other 80% is all Bethesda and now Blizzard. I kind of feel an embracer group situation happening with Microsoft. What do you guys think about this? Thanks for the continued content and entertainment. The quality level might turn into something like Embracer Group over time. I don't know, but they are certainly not in an Embracer Group situation because they have an enormous amount of capital. I mean, basically an infinite number of uh, an infinite amount of money profits from other parts. Remember, it's important to note this for every dollar that Microsoft makes gross revenue, six cents of it comes from Xbox, six pennies. So all of the money is being made in other parts of the company and flow in, you know, and flooded into less profitable or smaller parts of their, their business. And as I say over and over again, when you go into their financial statements each quarter, Xbox is presented to last. So what that says to me is that it's obviously small and inconsequential part of Microsoft compared to other parts of it, but it also probably operates with a great deal of latitude because it doesn't really matter, you know, and they can dump little bits of money in comparable to what they're making on something like Azure or office subscriptions or something like that. I just said office like I was back on Long Island, like really office. Yeah. office. office. I don't know where nice. that came from. <laughs> that yeah, happens sometimes, man. It's so yeah. sad. It's all right. And so <laughs> it's like my mom. <laughs> so there is there's that. And so I don't think it's an embracer group situation from a monetary or cat like embracer needs to sell games constantly and get an in, influx of capital behind it in order to survive, which is not going to happen. In fact, I don't know if you saw they laid off people at Zen Studios. So they're, they're laying people off at all these different teams that they had purchased over the years. I don't think that's going to happen here. And I don't think it's going to play out until the mid to long term how this all works out anyway. I think the bigger concern here is. And I don't know if people like Jez are missing this. He, he can tell me one way or the other if he ever hears this, but are they considering that the optical thing that if Microsoft goes after another big publisher, and I truly do believe this, if they go after another big publisher, it's going to turn on them. Like the, the goodwill or the passivity of most of the games industry is going to turn on them. Yeah. Because, and I'm not saying if they go and buy a developer or a small boutique publisher, I'm saying if they go after like a take two, a WB, a Sega, people are going to be like, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, what do you think you're doing exactly? Now you're buying a third publisher. No one buys publishers in this industry at all. And now you're buying a third one. And so I think that they have to kind of be, and from my perspective, at least in the optical, the PR game, very careful. Now they've mm-hmm. made, in my opinion, their big play. And you can make the argument with so many teams and IP and projects flowing that you don't really need more. Yeah. Like you should be able to get what you what you need out of the 35 to 40 teams that you own now. That should that should give you a game a quarter no problem of of a triple A variety, a game a quarter of the double A variety and all the different things that you can buy and license, you should be fine. So there's no need for Microsoft to buy more. And that's what I'm I'm confused about when people come to us guys and say, "Who should Sony buy?" And I think we all agreed no one preferably or very specific small teams. As I keep saying, I think if Helldivers does well, maybe you go buy Arrowhead. But that's the traditional sense in which Microsoft or Sony typically buys things. But there was a piece on GamesIndustry.biz, I don't know if you guys saw, uh, of a series of analysts speaking, saying that they there is a, a widely held belief that Sony will respond with a major acquisition. Yeah. And what they can afford to do. And I've said like take two and things like that are in their grasp simply because they can borrow money and leverage against the brand and bring other actors in if they wanted to. But money is so expensive to borrow right now that I think it would have to be a cash or stock deal. And so I don't think something like that would be big enough. But knowing that WB is available and really, again, I think that their their way to salvation, should they want to um, buy anything, is to just double and triple down on Japanese stuff, too. Um, and make PlayStation, make PlayStation unique. Dustin, you have something you'd like to what say. What do you think about Bandai Namco? That's one of the names I saw I think there's a lot of uh, synergy there with 
Sony owning Crunchyroll and um, Funimation, of course, mm-hmm. and Bandai yeah. Namco makes a lot of anime games. Uh, in addition to, of course, having Elden Ring, which I, they don't own from software, but they own the IP that they worked with. So, and, and as we know, and as we know, it, no one should have a problem with a game. You know, Elden Ring Two is obviously going to be a, a game that comes and is being made, no doubt, or or pre-produced with multiple platforms in mind. But we now know that the rules, as far as fan bases are concerned, is that when a game is made for something, it could later be taken away. So, Elden Ring Two would therefore become a PlayStation exclusive. Um, and maybe drive people crazy. Although if Sony is smart, they wouldn't do that at all and just sell mm-hmm. the game as wide and as far as you possibly could. Easily. I have yeah. heard this, but I, I drew the provenance back to this random dude on Twitter. I don't know if you saw this. The guy on Twitter claims that he worked at like a Sony studio in Europe and at deviation. And mm-hmm. I don't know who this person is. This is where this, like I drew this back from the Bandai Namco mm-hmm. stuff specifically. So right. I don't know the provenance of that. That does make some sense. Sega seems like they're off the market. If what you if you take them at their word with Microsoft, it, maybe they feel differently about Japanese suitors. Square Enix is obviously a, a, a con- although maybe they're not interested because they have new leadership now, too, and they kind of want to get out of this doldrums. They seem to be working more closely with Xbox, for instance. I don't know, dude. I just don't think that there are that many obvious targets. But yeah. So how do you guys feel? What Chris, what do you think? Should Xbox go after anyone else? What do you think about them? It's what I described on Twitter as a skin suit like Xbox's studio. They're wearing it's like it, it puts the lotion on its skin, <laughs> right? Like this isn't your skin, right? This is like you're going to cut it out and put it on you Buffalo Bill style. And that's what they've done. And mm-hmm. it is what it is. But I think it kind of muddies their identity. Now they just have a bunch of stuff. I mean, whether that matters or not, I have no idea. But I know that PlayStation and, and Nintendo have very strong internal identities that Microsoft lacks. And I think a lot of that comes from this specific approach so do you think right. they buy more things do you think do you agree with my thesis that there will be blowback on them now moving forward oh easily yeah yeah they've got the attention of everybody now because even there are people who have no business knowing anything about this who have asked me about like oh i heard microsoft's like buying like buying like they, they don't know the 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 nomenclature of the industry they couldn't say like oh publishers or developers or anything but they they would they, they brought this stuff up to me like my parents brought this up to me and i'm like well how do you this is reaching you guys that's crazy yeah it's probably on cnbc Um, or something you know like yeah so so i mean now that they have this this many eyes on them after a big acquisition like this yeah i I do think if they if they play their (coughs) hand any more than this or if they extend their reach any more than this they're going to have to deal with a lot of a a lot of (laughs) checks and balances levied their way that they probably would be better off not dealing with uh, the counterpoint to that is Activision is so big that ever, anything else that they could acquire seems small in comparison and therefore probably wouldn't. Like, I, I feel like that's also possible, too, that it's like, oh, well, so what? They're going to buy Ubisoft. What does Ubisoft have? Like, that's nothing compared to Activision. Why wouldn't they be allowed to get Ubisoft, <laughs> which is a valid argument in some way. But like, I do think I do think at least the. From a general consumer standpoint, from the general uh, community standpoint, the goodwill that they've garnered would probably go away if they tried to extend any further than they than they have already. I think Activision is plenty like that's way that's even way bigger than I thought that they would even go in the first place. Like Bethesda was huge, but that it seemed at, at the very least that seemed appropriate in some way. Like it was like, OK, well, if you if this this checks out in some way like there's there's a long history with xbox and, and bethesda games and all this stuff and and it's a relatively smaller publisher what, what did they get them for like seven yeah it was like seven yeah i'll look it up a 6.5 which is 7, still which is still huge by the way it's still an insane amount of money like an, in, <laughs> an amount of money that is incomprehensible to every single human being alive i don't yeah, care 7. who you 7. are 7.5 uh but for Activision to be like what at, at, in the 60s, yeah, 60 68. billion, yeah. 68 billion, 69 AU, uh, that's Ooh. pretty rough, man. That's like that's that's enormous on a on a scale that I didn't even think was previously possible. So, yeah, I think I think they would be wise to kind of batten down the hatches and be like, OK, we've got everything that we could possibly need. We have so many teams. We have so many IP. Let's just seal ourselves away for a while. And gestate on this, marinate on it, get get some stuff cooking with all of the tools and and talent that we have at our disposal now. I think if they made any more acquisitions, it would be like a really rough go for them. 
I think yeah. it would be not as kind. I agree. I don't know that they would have any legal boundaries, although it was made clear to me that just because they would try to buy naturally, there's only smaller entities than Activision Blizzard. So you would assume on one hand, OK, so they would get away with anything now and, and the other. But the, the situation right, yeah. is. But on the other hand, I think the legal reality is that the situation is materially different each acquisition. So now they look at it through the new lens of what you're doing. And yeah. And, and they look at they're probably looking at it through the, through the lens of like all the problems that they had to go through just to get this one through. I, right. I, I do have to imagine on some level that they're. Look, I don't know. I don't know for sure. I don't know like how hungry, how hungry the beast is. But I would have to imagine that on some level, after all of this, 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 in, uh, all of this hardship, and especially the the damage that's been done to them, just because of this leak that happened, uh, as a result of all this, th- that's probably good enough reason for them to be like, you know what, <laughs> we got Call of Duty we'll be all right. <laughs> like, let's, let's focus on what we got now, because I think that's also part of it too, where it's like, I think a lot of the, um, and honestly to Xbox's credit in, in framing the entire conversation, you know, the perspective was like, Hey, look, they're on the back foot. They need to make a crazy play. Um, and call of duty is the, that crazy play. And, but it's also such a crazy play that I, I think most people who pay attention to this industry in any real capacity even at a casual capacity would be like well you've got call of duty now no real excuse at this point why you should really be looking for anything else you already have the biggest thing (laughs) anything else would just seem gratuitous uh and so i think that would be largely the perspective but yeah i think you're right yeah yeah dustin do you agree what do you want to add here the only thing i would want to add i think we've talked about this before but it's worth reiterating that i think that they need to be careful as they expand so wide being a platform holder i think makes it the content you make has a different level of prestige to it then and i think that they got a rude awakening with redfall where phil kind of on kind of funny had to be explained well we weren't really overseeing that yet which i thought was insane that he said that but he he kind of had to make excuses about why would they as xbox release a product like that and while i am a fan of many activision blizzard games uh blizzard in particular in terms of release quality has been very problematic for a very long time uh with yeah. mixed results and so now the buck stops with Xbox. And I think that they have to realize that it's like the more, the bigger your umbrella, if though their successes will raise you up, but those mistakes are also no longer going to reflect just Activision or Blizzard or whatever. They're going to reflect Xbox. Yeah, so well said. it's right. a, it's 100%. a risky move. Yeah. It's well said. I think, um, What I what I mean, this is the harsh reality. People can take it how it is for from my perspective, but it's like what studio has become better since Microsoft bought it? Like what studio now we haven't had some not every studio has even gotten a chance to go. But when you think about the studios they bought in 2018, it's like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, yeah. so (laughs) I I don't I still am not a believer that they can even manage what they have right now. I don't know if that's I think that's why it's vital for them to keep all these things siloed. Because you definitely don't want Microsoft's internal game studio fucking juices on Bethesda or especially on Activision Blizzard. In fact, what I was saying earlier is that if they had any intelligence at all, they would take all of the executives from them and put them, install them in really key positions in Xbox Studios and have them fix that shit. Um, And, you know, have it running better. You know, you know, the guys that make Call of Duty, you know, those those dummies. Yeah, that's like almost the best you can get. That's why I think Pete Hines leaving. And that's why I'll get to my conspiracy about Pete Hines is. I like Pete Hines. He's a really sweet guy. I've had extensive conversations with him in the past. He's always treated me with a lot of respect, and he's very, very smart and very, very passionate. From my perspective, that dude bled Bethesda. Now, things change. You met me 10 years ago. I bled IGN. Things change, right? Obviously, things change. But my assumption is based on the timing of everything is that he's vested and out of there. And I would be sh- I would be shocked if he doesn't come pop up somewhere else. Pete Hines is a well-known player. And we also know, by the way, that Mikami is basically through his non-complete clause uh, leaving Tango. So he's about to come back too. 
it doesn't, in other words, I'm not seeing people like, not that this is wide, but it's like a couple examples of people being like, oh, I'm, I can leave. I'm leaving. I mean, that's, that's the way I perceive it. And my, I guess where the conspiracy comes in with Pete Hines is I read that email or those emails from, from discovery as him not being happy about after the Activision deal about like, why can't we be on everything? What is this? That's the way I read it. And I think a lot of people were kind of wish casting in the way they were reading that email. For people that don't know what I'm talking about, it was an email that Pete Hines kind of angrily sent to some people at Microsoft being like, we're blindsided by this Activision thing. What do we go tell our people when they say, oh, Call of Duty's on PlayStation? Why isn't Starfield? In so many words. And yeah. uh, he just didn't seem like he, uh, that doesn't strike me. That seems to me to be a very comfortable person uh, showing a lot of anger in my opinion, at an email in an email chain with some pretty high up people. I don't know. Maybe we're reading into it too much. We'll never know for sure, but I wish him the very best. But I think that that kind of stuff is going to be really important. Keeping key names in place is going to be vital. Look at what Respawn has been able to do by keeping certain names in place. And now look at what they're trying to do by expanding the reach of Respawn within the other studios overseeing everything because they believe in that magic. That's what I think Xbox should embrace. It's like the magic of Activision Blizzard. Whether or not you agree with the culture of the way they make games, whether or not you like their C-suite or Bobby Kotick, the reality is, is that Call of Duty is a fucking machine. They never, ever miss. I mean, that's what I say. Can you believe that? Yeah. They, they never, they haven't had one year since 2004, I guess, because Call of Duty was 2003 and Call of Duty 2 was 2005. Ever since then, not one year where they're like, ah, oh, fuck, we messed up. No game this year. They somehow make it work. That's incredible. Yeah. Black Ops 4 was like the last, the last one that really even came close to that. And they still, they were just like, ah, no single player. Right. No campaign. Right. Yeah. But that was the only time that I could even think they still got the game out. Mm-hmm. You know, the multiplayer for it, which is the, impressive you know, to me. You yeah. Know? Because it's, a well-oiled it's not- machine. Exactly. And it's not I mean, no disrespect to Redwood Shores or EA Vancouver or any of the studios that make sports games, visual concepts, obviously, but it's a little different. You're taking this package like a baseball game at Sony San Diego and refining the same thing to the finest sheen that you possibly can. You only have nine or 10 months to do it. You got to get the product out so you can only have to pick and choose and everything else remains the same. But it's the same game. I mean, it's impressive when you think about Call of Duty. It just it fundamentally changes. Everything about it changes except for the way you play it. It's a shooter. But yeah, the, the stories change, the characters change, the stages change, the weapons change like and that's if I were an Xbox fan, that's the thing I would be excited about getting is that's that's an insane level of production, a complete symphony. And it's not a symphony that's giving you some people. A lot of people are disenchanted with Call of Duty, but it's not giving you like some fucking bullshit. One million game seller. Like these games have an addicted audience that's that sell billions of, of of dollars worth of gross revenue in games a year mm-hmm. so use that because the reality is is that you brought up redfall sony would never release a game like that we all know that yeah like i it's can't crazy. think of a game like that like in the last two generations that would be anywhere like that knack would be the last thing i remember coming from like in a triple a quality that way like, people didn't really like yeah yeah the- the, other, the only thing I can think of is a caveat with uh, Destruction All-Stars. Yeah, that's second party, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. and but the, and then they ended up giving it away on PlayStation Plus. Right. So they kind of knew yeah. and, and did what they could. With and, the yeah. and they cut Lucid free. I mean, Lucid was by all accounts working on Twisted Metal. So, um, you know, they booted them out. So they made a decision based on that which is what you want. See, you, you that's why the old Sony way of doing things, I think, is somewhat special. Like you test the waters. Thank God they didn't just go buy Lucid. Yeah. You know, and then they had they're stuck with this fucking team. At least you try things out and see how they, things work. So I don't think Microsoft necessarily runs into legal problems. Should they want to buy something else? Obviously, depending on the scale of it, I just think that they have to worry about the PR angle of it, because I think I'm already wondering what your intention is. And I'm sure that more agnostic voices are going to start wondering what your intention is. If you come out and say, oh, we're buying, you know, WB. It's like, all right, guys. Yeah, relax. Come on, man. You know, Colin, yeah. yeah, this is something the comments brings up because I remember we've had this this scratch some part of my brain. Yeah. And one of the biggest counter arguments, which I think stands mostly, is that The Last of Us Part One on PC. Total bad port job. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, we've brought this up in the past. I, I mean, I hate to say this, but I don't care. 
it's not they're not a PC studio. They're trying to like port a game internally to PC and it didn't work out. But it's not the the game is on PS5 where it's awesome. And so I hear you, but that's fair enough, you know, depending on some of the PC ports, you know. Yeah, um, I think the, the, the difference is the, 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 the difference, though, would be that Redfall in its best form is <laughs> is not very good at all, <laughs> which is kind of the kind of the main issue there. It's that's not necessarily true. like it's not a performance. Like a, it's a design yeah like it's, 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 and it's performance it's like at its core like what it is it's like it's just this is not good <laughs> and i hate to say that it's it's not like golem level bad it's like certainly playable and it's like look man if, you, if you've got nothing better to do it's not the worst thing you'd be playing but at the same time it's you know it's it, it it's not a matter of technical performance or or glitches or bugs on something that is otherwise absent of those flaws fantastic it is Instead, something that is defined primarily by those flaws and without them, it's just unremarkable, which is uh, sad. Yeah, that's fair. I, 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 I'm happy that we get to walk away from this topic finally. Yeah. I must admit in closing that while I was bored with it at times, that I was kind of more bored with people's complaints about the subject in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. as if we make the news. And right. this kind of stuff is highly relevant to the trajectory of the industry mm-hmm. so while and i've said this before and i know chris vehemently disagrees with me but i i find it weird to be into something enough to listen to a podcast about it but not interested enough in how the the, the sausage is made that's weird to me it's like i love football mm-hmm. enough to l- listen to a podcast about it therefore i love f- football enough to know the to really care about the machinations behind the scene not just the games on sunday and that's kind of the way i approach the podcast so yeah. For those out there that were into it, I was I was happy that you were into it. I was into it at times. I got a little bored with it. It got long in the tooth, no doubt. A lot of ups and downs, quite Shakespearean in a lot of ways in the drama that it delivered because um, it looked like it was dead and it looked like it was living and it, it was all over the place, but it's done. And um, I wish everyone the very best involved with it. I know a lot of people, you know, I, I, I'm friends, per, you know, close friends with a couple people that work at Activision still and Studio Sledgehammer specifically. And I'll be curious to see how everyone feels about it in the new culture. I know Activision seems to externally have a, this really poor culture and Microsoft, as I've said many times, has a very positive culture of working there. People I know that worked at Microsoft really like working at Microsoft or liked working at Microsoft when they did. So maybe that will bring some healing to that situation too. But as far as I'm concerned, and this was said earlier, no more excuses. Mm-hmm. You no, know, you're not selling Xboxes, Game Pass subscriptions aren't growing, or whatever. No more excuses. Once this stuff enters, and by the way, they said 2024 will be when Activision Blizzard stuff starts to show up. So when that happens, there are no more excuses. Like, yeah. I'm sick of hearing it. I'm sick of hearing about how you need to do all these things to compete. Well, now you have to compete and see how that all goes. Um, and we'll see if maybe they make the situation better. The one example of a studio I think Xbox might have made better or at least sustained in a good way is what we'll talk about next. Number two. In truly incredible news that was conspicuously buried in a random blog posting, Minecraft has officially surpassed an astonishing 300 million copies sold, what making the it the fuck? best-selling video game of all time. Word comes by way of the game's official website, which reports on its Minecraft Live 2023 event. Minecraft first launched on PC in beta form in 2011 and first coming to console in 2012 via an Xbox 360 port, was purchased outright by Microsoft in 2014, and at $2.5 billion, it proved to be one of the great steals in industry history. The sandbox survival game migrated to PlayStation 3 in 2013 and PS4 and Vita in 2014 and is yet to be given a native PlayStation 5 port. Not that it really matters, as it's still one of PSN's most popular games month in and month out, year in and year out. Developed by independent developer turned Xbox team Mojang, the game continues to receive plentiful updates and maintains a monthly user base of more than 100 million players about what PlayStation manages to snag with every game available on its hardware combined. Rockstar's 2013 smash hit Grand Theft Auto V sits in second place on the global sales chart at 185 million copies sold, showing you the true cultural heft of Mo Yang's game. And the developer shared some fun stats to celebrate, including that on average, in an average day in the game, players kill more than 15 million skeletons, craft nearly 9 million pickaxes, discover nearly 7 million diamonds, and so on. And no, these sales figures don't include the trifecta of Minecraft spinoffs, none of which were particularly popular, especially in comparison. Telltale's Minecraft story mode launched on PS3 and PS4 episodically between 2015 and 2017, while internally shepherded Minecraft Dungeons came to PS4 in 2020 with 2023's Minecraft Legends following on PS4 and PS5 earlier this year. Chris, 300 million copies of Minecraft sold. I remember being at IGN 
when this purchase happened and I was like, man, what in my, I didn't, I didn't write about it. It wasn't my, it wasn't my beep. But I was like, that seems like a lot of money. And then you, <laughs> and then you fast forward to this and they have more Minecraft has as many monthly active users as PlayStation network. That's that insane. is that that is that is truly that is truly wild. That's nine. That's ninety percent of the U.S. population. Yes, that is so. <laughs> that is so insane. Holy shit! Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, I mean, congrats to them, man. They they knew what uh, they knew. What, I remember. It's so funny because I remember when Minecraft kind of came out and it was starting to kind of explode. There was a lot of. There were a lot of let's plays specifically early on in YouTube with with Minecraft. And I remember I remember seeing all these like Minecraft clones. Like there was like Fortress Craft on like the original <laughs> Xbox Arcade. That was like the really poor man's Minecraft where you could play as your dumb little avatars or whatever the hell. And there was that one that wasn't there a two D one Terraria that did a, like did did pretty well. Well, yeah, that was, yeah. it still does well. Yeah, yeah Terraria is still yeah Terraria is different enough where I'm like that's just a completely different game oh, to okay. me. But because the two D nature of it alone transforms like every everything about that game but yeah dude like i mean congrats to those guys they clearly know what's they clearly know how to make a successful product 300 million that's so nuts what the hell man it's wild i mean it's wild now you assume obviously people are buying it some people are buying it over and over again for their different platforms and all of the rest but still i mean you have to you also have to imagine that there's probably a lot of uh education like uh, minecraft has a place in a lot of schools as well mm -hmm. so that's probably factors in but i mean that it's it's amazing that that's even true like that's even something that could happen in the first place. Like it's like, oh yeah, this is a game that we're obviously going to install on our school computers. What? Yeah, it's it's, it's like a number munchers in my day. <laughs> yeah, like all the Apple II games that we had. Yeah, number munchers sold. Th <laughs> Can you if number munchers number. was as big as Minecraft was? That'd be so fucking this would be such a different world. We'd probably be more, probably weird, be a lot smarter. That weird frog. Right. Yeah, I loved those games yeah. when I was a kid. It yeah. felt so yeah. futuristic too because we didn't have a computer at home at that time. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, it's funny because Dustin Minecraft is one of those games that became relatively big enough in my periphery where I was like, I should probably check this out when I was uh, during the PS3 or PS4 era, probably. And I did play I, I, I and then maybe it was when I came to Vita. I was like, maybe this is a cool place for it to, to play it. I just don't get it, but I understand intellectually what people are into about it. And that's great. But what I'm more impressed by is really Microsoft's ability to extract this. This is the in the in the meme we love to reference the small big domino meme this is the small domino that where the big domino is microsoft buys activision blizzard it was like the moyang purchase that was their first really meaningful purchase probably since rare where they really were trying to move the needle and a lot of people didn't have faith in them that's what i was saying like this might be one example of a studio that they bought that they at least sustained like you could imagine that they bought minecraft and that thing original you have to try to keep something like this relevant yeah. It doesn't just happen. There's no inertia. Entropy is just going to take this thing into the ground. Like you. So there was some something happened between now and then and over the last almost 10 years that allowed it to get this far. It sold most of his copies after Microsoft bought it. So um, so you have to give them credit for that. But what do you think about this? 300 million copies sold, even with all the caveats of multiple purchases and educational stuff and all of that. I just think that that's wild. Just an incredible thing. And I wonder how um, Notch feels about that as far as selling for what he did. I would think that he is so rich that you would have to be an asshole to feel for be his, from his perspective, be like, I wish I had even more money. Yeah. But at yeah. the same time, if I knew that that would, that's probably worth, I don't know, 10 times what he paid, what he sold it for. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah. What do you think? Dude, Minecraft is awesome. I am. It's funny just because this game now, I think with it becoming as saturated as it has, there's, there's been waves, particularly where it's, you know, Minecraft is a kid's game and it's annoying because it's like, do you have Minecraft on your phone? You know, your seven year old cousin or something. Right, right. But legitimately, I think Minecraft still to this day is an amazing game that uh, I, I remember. I have nostalgic feelings thinking back to in 11th grade in our study hall, you could get the, the laptops that no one actually worked on. You just, you know, got and fucked around, used V tunnel or whatever to just browse the web. But we figured out a way that you could put a special version of Minecraft on a USB stick that you could launch from those laptops. So we definitely were doing that. And uh, oh, thank you. Who is that? Perfect, Perfect time. Who's that? Oh, who is that? Um, <laughs> who is you. that? <laughs> um, 
What was I saying? Oh yeah. So oh, we were like, you know, we we I wonder if I'm one of the first three million. Maybe I wasn't there at the very beginning of Minecraft, but definitely be- way before the purchase and way before they even released the game. In its one, I bought it in early access. That's pretty so, right. Yeah, yeah. Long time ago. This game's still great. It's funny to think about when I've played it with friends. There is. It's a, it has like adventure modes and you can do very specific tasks, but we always played it like we were little kids designing our own island where it's like, oh, I'm going to build my house here. And we can have a little cool tunnel that connects our houses together and then we'll build this thing over here and we would build this land together, you know, as as 18 year olds, as if we're little kids playing with blocks. But. I would still imagine today that that would be super fun. It's been many years since I've played it at this point, but uh, I, I love to hear the success. I love to hear about how, as Chris was saying, how it's been integrated into schools and used as an education tool. And I will say I will, res- I super respect Microsoft for keeping it totally open. And I feel like they have been a good shepherd of mm-hmm. Minecraft, at least from the outside. I don't know how that maybe that community feels different, but I do think that they've they've done a good job, particularly with Minecraft and, and how they've handled. It. I'm surprised there's not a Minecraft movie yet. I think that was like in development at some point. But yeah, I feel like that's obvious. This is where they're missing now. The, this is where they're missing the multimedia synergies that Sony has, like the advantage mm, of. Yeah. And this is what I was saying that people get offended by it, but it's not a judgment call. It's just that Microsoft's not a creative company. Right. So it's a, it's right. a services company. And so that makes it hard for, I think, those things to kind of it's like they're botching or relative. I mean, from what I understand, they're botching of the Halo show. It's like you can't let that happen. You know, you, you, you can't let that happen. You can't you let Master Cheeks happen. I'm sorry. You gotta, I'm sorry, Chris. I didn't mean to rub salt in the wound. Yeah, it's OK. You got to remind me of that. It's fine. So it's fine. How but, do you feel about seeing Master Chief's butt? I just want to know. That's not Master Chief. It's not, I feel fine about it because it's not Master Chief. <laughs> that's, Would you that's, view ma- that's that's not messy that's jimmy rings we decided but what uh if, what if you could view master chief's butt would you like, I, I, like hey <laughs> we we have this asset where you can asset asset <laughs> uh where you can see master chief's yeah. butt i mean you're gonna look at it right i'm definitely gonna take a peek out of curiosity but like it, sure. it wouldn't yeah yeah yeah. but i, I can't say i'm do all that anything in- about it well no 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 I wouldn't do it. I'd maybe save it in like a hidden folder on my phone, but that's about it. Sure. But uh, <laughs> save for a bad day. What the hell are we talking about? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's funny that you, I, I do, because when did, how much did Notch um, sell it? I think for? it was 2.5 billion. Oh, that's pretty, that's pretty good. It's funny. It's funny you mentioned it because like he was, uh, and this is, this is not fake at all. He was a patron of mine for like a, a while, like wow. Notch. And I remember being like, is that Notch? That's <laughs> like, I think I DM'd him a couple times. I was like, this is crazy. And I was like, hey. And he was at like my, the $25 tier or whatever. I was like, I mean, come, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, I, but, yeah, go ahead. But, uh, he was very controversial, though. I mean, he's yeah, kind he of been. Yeah, he unfollowed I, me a while, like at some point. And I was like, oh, well, I don't, I don't know why. But. Well, that's and that's the thing is that I feel bad because I know he was controversial, but I don't know. I don't know why I can't remember. I'm just totally unaware. So maybe it's Uh, I'm sure he's I'm sure he's happy with his tons of money. Well, what I remember about him, Marcus Person, I'm looking at his stuff now. Controversy is there a controversy person began began receiving criticism. This is Wikipedia for political and social opinions. He expressed on social media as early as 2016. He has since been accused of homophobia, racism, transphobia, and supporting conspiracy theories. However, the citation says better sources. Does he work for Last Stand Media too? Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. Da, 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 da. So yeah, I, I don't. I don't know for sure. These are all from 2017, 2018, or so. I guess people have to look into it for themselves. I will say that what I remember about him is that there he moved. I don't know if he already lived in L.A., but he moved, as I remember, to L.A. Bought like a huge house there, and I don't know if you, any of you guys remember this, but like would have or at least did have yeah, a these- huge. Part, crazy yeah. parties right yeah i yeah. was i was invited to one of them i didn't go because <laughs> it was it scared me <laughs> right like they were they were supposed to be nuts like i remember i never got invited to one but i remember there was supposed to be like some crazy candy wall and like all sorts like weird yeah. shit in there yeah that yeah. was like rich man like or nouveau riche kind of s- stuff going on which was which is totally cool especially when you have that much money but um that's what i remember yeah. about him so he was very socially popular 
like during that era of when he sold Minecraft. And then, yeah, he started speaking too much. And yeah. who knows well, well, if what he was saying is really offensive or not. I don't really know. Yeah. What I had heard, like, look, I don't know. This is all pure conjecture. But what I had heard was that he would throw parties at his house and then he really wouldn't interact with anybody. Like he would just kind of throw them. Like, it, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was exactly, exactly, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I kind of, I should have went. I don't know what it was. It freaked me out the idea of it because I had just got to LA too, and I was like, I'm, I'm gonna go to a mansion party at Notch's house. I don't know, man. I feel like, I feel like that's the the day I die. You know, like it just seemed like too extreme of a of a leap. But oh well. That house that he bought, I remembered this. I looked it up. He outbid Beyonce and Jay Z. That's, that's right. <laughs> he outbid. Them. Yeah, seventy million dollars. So yeah, he's fine regardless. But yeah, I, I'd be interested to talk to him. No, I know I've noticed. I don't know. I don't follow him on Twitter, but I feel like he's kind of disappeared. What I would like to it's it's like the George Lucas thing where I want to see this great per, like this great auteur that maybe you don't want to call him an auteur, but a, let's say a designer that made something huge and great. Like, could you come back with something new and do it again? Yeah. I've always been curious about that with George Lucas. Like, I, I don't know if George Lucas is just as lazy, not inclined, doesn't have the ideas, but I would have this burning fire in me to do something new and awesome. And I would have already long done it since since I sold, you know, to, to, to Disney or whatever. So, yeah, I would like to see that for him, too. But maybe he's just uh, I've never had a billion dollars. So maybe I would just be very I that would that amount of money would break me down to my my Ross essentials where I'd be like, I'm done. I'm not doing anything anymore. Like, oh, yeah. Easily. What do you what's there to do when you like? For the fun of the game, I guess, because that would be it. There would yeah. be no no need at that point. So, all right. Congratulations to Microsoft and Mo Yang. For 300 million sold. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. And finally, number three, as we like to do each month, let's go over sales data from the biggest core gaming market in the world, the United States. The following sales data comes from research firm Circana and represents numbers for the month of September 2023. For software, Xbox and PC exclusive Starfield topped the charts. With PC, it's lead skew. Not a huge surprise considering the Game Pass effect. It immediately slots in at a very respectable eighth in the year-to-date charts, charts ahead of the likes of Final Fantasy 16. Other notable games include newcomers Mortal Kombat 1 at 2, EA Sports FC, that's FIFA, 24 at 3, Payday 3 at 5, NBA 2K24 at 6, and The Crew Motorfest at 7. Other notable mentions include Armored Core 6 at 8, Resident Evil 4 Remake at 12, and Gran Turismo 7 at 17. Year-to-date here in the U.S., Hogwarts Legacy remains the best-selling game of 2023. Other notable games on the year-to-date list include Star Wars Jedi Survivor at 5, Mortal Kombat 1 at 8, Resident Evil 4 Remake at 9, MLB The Show 23 at 10, Dead Island 2 at 11, Final Fantasy 16 at 12, Street Fighter 6 at 13, Armored Core 6 at 16, Elden Ring at 17, Remnant 2 at 18, and Dead Space Remake at 19. I'm, I'm so surprised how poorly Dead Space, I mean, relatively, Remnant 2 outsold Dead Space Remake. You guys got to get it the fuck together out there, seriously. Oh, and over in Europe, PlayStation 5's dominance is even more pronounced. While its competition in Microsoft and Nintendo are down 35% and 28% year over year when it comes to their hardware sales, Sony's PlayStation 5 is up 175% year over year on the continent. So PS5 doing great. Joe B wrote in and said, hey, boys, new September sales charts come out and has one big surprise with it. No, not that Starfield is the top seller, thus once again pointing out that the Game Pass destroys sales narrative is flawed. But that Baldur's Gate on PS is nowhere to be seen in the top 10. Thoughts? It seemed a lot of people wanted to use this game as a PlayStation exclusive, even when the dev said it's not. And it still didn't sell well enough to beat Hogwarts Legacy or Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Uh, Larian, as far as I understand, doesn't report sales data. They're like one of the few holdouts. So Baldur's Mm -hmm. Gate is not on the chart because of that. It has nothing to do with anything else as I understand it. Um, As far as the Game Pass destroys sales narrative, Starfield, I would imagine, sold somewhere between five and seven million copies would be like my highest estimate. And that's probably more like five, maybe five to six million copies. And my suspicion is that Spider-Man 2 will outsell Starfield showing you the Game Pass effect because it will only be available on PS5. But we'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, And it it might take two months, but it'll happen. One one quick thing to call on about that Baldur's Gate is that if you go to the PlayStation blog, it was the number two selling game on PSN. Uh, in September. Yeah, so, I don't know why but, Larian doesn't provide their sales data, and I'm not entirely sure if you can go back and retroactively do so, and I, I don't know why that would be bespoke or secret, especially if your game's selling well. Right. Um, yeah, there's no doubt that Baldur's Gate 3 sold a ton. Yeah. I like, would, a met, right. like an insane amount. Yeah. it's uh, That's an important I caveat, I would say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
But nonetheless, congratulations to all involved. Starfield, I had no doubt Starfield would be the number one game of the month because of the PC sales and the millions. What I'm more surprised about and what I think is, I, I don't know, am I, am I off base here? Kind of bleak that Xbox didn't outsell PS5, right? I mean, when you really think about it, that's, I'll say again that I just don't think that that brand within Xbox studios as we understand them now, certainly not with Call of Duty moving forward, but they're not going to get another burst like that again. There's not, I don't, I don't believe there's going to be another Starfield level game out of them for, for years. And I know some people say like Avowed or whatever, and Fable, and I'm like, I don't think so. Like Starfield is a Bethesda game. It's, it's just mm-hmm. inherently bigger. So do you, am I off base? I expected Xbox to sell PS5, and I think it's not a great sign for that brand that they didn't. I think when we're projecting about the IP that we know about, I'd say that is true, but I also never projected a game like Baldur's Gate 3 would be as big. Yeah, that's fair. So it would have it would have to require like Fable to come out and be a 95 or something. And I think then even it might still be a little tough, but I think it is possible, but it would have to be next level game breaking like Baldur's Gate was or something like that. Yeah, fair enough. That's a good point. Um, so anyway, that's the sales data as we understand it now. And shout out to all that um, participated and did well this month, especially some of the, the year to date stuff. Again, Remnant 2, killing it, hanging on. Yeah. Armored Core 6, doing really well for From. Dead Space Remake at 19. I don't like that. Mm. Like but Dead Space Remake, other than Final Fantasy 16, is probably my favorite game this year. Yeah, I I, honestly, awesome. it's I still think about it like still. <laughs> after all this after all this time i kind of was thinking it's too early to replay it but I, I have had an itch to play it again for whatever reason it's on like, game I, pass i think this month oh cool yeah Which i mean well do i have it on I, I don't remember where i played it um I was thinking about maybe getting some achievements or whatever but it's it's so good it, it, Dead Space Remake is really, really, really great. I actually liked it more than Resident Evil 4. I know it's probably a controversial I do, I did too. opinion, but like I, I loved Dead Space. I'm like, with you. A lot. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. I, I thought they were both awesome, but I, no, I, no, would no, take, yeah, yeah. I would take Dead Space over Resident Evil. I don't think most people feel that way, but mm-hmm. I agree with you completely, Chris. That's because we have oh, good yeah, taste. <laughs> All right, that's it for the news. Let's get into the six questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience. For the uninitiated, we... Solicit your inquiries on patreon.com slash last media in a news feed posting each and every week. We call the thread. You put your inquiries in there. I comb through them. I put them into the show, intersperse them as you've seen. And we end with six more of them at the end here. Thank you for your support over there. We could not do it without you over on Patreon. Brian Lonsdale wrote in and said, good afternoon to my favorite threesome. This question is for Colin. The past few weeks, you've been debating on what to play in your downtime this holiday season. You've been mulling over games like Skyrim and every Call of Duty of the past 10 years. I know this is a PlayStation podcast. But have you given any thought about new about, uh, I'm sorry, Mario Wonder? Nintendo has finally given us something in the 2D space that's not the new Super Mario art style for the first time since Super Mario World. It currently has an impressive 92 on Metacritic and seems like a perfect chill game to play on football Sundays. Thanks for the daily amazing content and have a great day. I, I actually watched a trailer for it and I'm just like, I don't know, man. It's totally, I think it's, I have, listen, no one's denying that it's great. I'm sure it is. I just, I just don't need this anymore. I'm not into it anymore. It's too... I'm over Nintendo now. It's it's like my Star Wars stuff. I just I've moved on, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have to say, I, I played. So my favorite 3D Mario is Galaxy or Sunshine. Hell yeah. And my t- I love the 2D Mario's like the true 2D Mario's. Super Mario World is one of the greatest games of all time, in my opinion. So I'm a big Mario fan going back a long ways. I just it's very similar to Pokemon where it's like, all right, I'm good now. You make little changes and little tweaks and you got this little gameplay quirk and all this, but I'm sure it's very well made and I'm sure it's going to sell an enormous amount of copies. And Dagan and I were laughing actually on uh, because I was saying about Spider-Man too. like, it's so funny how Nintendo doesn't give a flying fuck about (laughs) Spider-Man 2 and is just releasing the game on the same day, which I think is so baller and awesome, you know, and they don't care about each other, really. And so that just goes to show you it's going to be a phenomenal game, a phenomenal commercial hit. It's already a critical hit, but. There's just other games handheld for football Sundays. Baby boy, baby boy, Brian, the portal comes out in just a couple of weeks. My friend, it's almost time. And then there'll be no need for that stinky switch anymore. Mm. Um, We have to figure out what I'm going to play, though. Dustin, you have something you want to say? I was just I'm so excited for Wander. I had to express. I mean, as the host of the Nintendo podcast, of course, I'm going to be excited for Wander. But how cool is it that we have two games 
one rated 92 on open critic and the other one rated 91 coming out on the same day. And even if it is, you know, it's, it's tough to juggle games sometimes at the same time. These are two games you can easily juggle at the same time. When I get home tomorrow, I'm playing Mario wonder first as my, you know, fun time after Friday afternoon, whatever. And then kind of dive into Spider-Man later than I, I just can't, that is so exciting to me that, both of these games, I, I think it's amazing and an awesome benefit that they're releasing on the same day. It sucks if you can't afford both. I get that. But even if you can only afford one, you're going to have a good fucking time either way. Yeah. So I'm not very, very excited. Dude, it, w- it would be cool enough if these games came out on the sa- in the same year. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's, they're, they're on the same day. This year, this year is crazy. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. <laughs> this year is insane, man. Well, let's look at this for just real quick. Baldur's Gate. I'm using Open Critic. Baldur's Gate 3, 96. Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, 96. Resident Evil 4 Remake, 92. Mario Wonder, 92. <laughs> Street Fighter 6, 92. Marvel Spider-Man 2, 91. Uh, and that's it for the 90s. But all that's of those. That's a lot, games, man. That's a lot of 90s. The only one of those that I haven't. Well, I haven't played Spider-Man or Wonder, of course, but I haven't played Street Fighter 6. But yeah, all those games are excellent. And even the ones just it doesn't have to be a 90 for it to be amazing. Of course, like all of the high 80s and just amazing games in general this year. So good. Yeah. By the way, I just, you know, just totally apropos of nothing. I, I looked I'm saying that a lot today as well. I looked over at my my other monitor and my Twitter feed has just been up for hours and, it, and there's a tweet. I forget, you guys wouldn't care about this, but I think it's so wild. Do you know that there's going to be flag or they're considering adding flag football to the Olympics in 2028, which is awesome. And that the NFL is inclined to let its players play. So can you imagine team USA's flag football team? <laughs> no. And how much it's going to be like the dream team. Do you guys know the 92 dream team, the NBA, the NBA basketball team that like dominated the Olympics and fucking murdered everyone. Because yeah. it was, because NBA players were allowed to play for the first time, like NHL mm-hmm. players were not allowed to play in the Olympics until Nagano. That was 1998. Before that, you had to be an amateur. It was usually college students, and so there was a lot more parity between like the professionals or the, the or rather the, the amateurs overseas. <laughs> but then the NBA players started being able to play in the Olympics and just absolutely fucking clowning <laughs> think, everyone. It's hysterical. I, I think I know about that purely because of there's there's an episode of uh, what we do in the shadows uh, about that. Oh. Have you seen that? Have you guys seen that show? By the way, no. I've that seen show the movie. Is, the movie's great. The show is awesome. The show's like is it, way better. It's way I better than sure. I thought I it was I saw the be. first episode, so I'm guilty of that. But I thought, uh, I don't know. But it's I've heard good. the show's great. It's yeah. There's an episode where the, the, where the vampires tries to get, uh, tries to finish his citizenship. And the first time he tried to do it was like in that year because he wanted to support the U.S. <laughs> Olympics team or whatever. Yeah, it was it's awesome. It's like, it, dude, like you guys should, for people that don't know, like go look up the basketball. It is hysterical how good the team is. It's like Jordan and Pippin and Magic Johnson and Bird and like like the most incredible array of players like John Stockton and Carl Malone. And it was like, holy moly. And they just steamrolled everyone. Oh, my God. Carl Malone. And, Crazy. But I think about it with flag football, where we're the only country that really even plays football at a, at a dominant level. More countries are playing it. The NFL is playing overseas more and more often. But I just I, I'm getting in my mind. I'm like, that is going to be the funniest shit ever. They're going to fucking kill these other teams. Um. The 98 Olympics were see this worked against us, though, when when professionals were allowed to play hockey, the NHL allowed their team, their players to play that benefited basically everybody. And the game just was elevated around the world. But we have so many foreign players in the NHL. It's foreign Mm -hmm. dominated league, actually, which I don't think a lot of people realize if they don't watch hockey. But it's true. So many Russians. You guys have some problems with that. Mm -hmm. They're born on the ice. They are born on the ice. I learned how to skate when I was six, and that was considered really late. So. Yeah, it is. And I, yeah, I, 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 and I, I learned yeah. it even later. So yeah. I fell on my face the very first time I, I went on the ice and busted my lip, bled mm-hmm. all over the ice. <laughs> it's, it's fun. All right. But I stuck with it. I loved it. I love hockey so much. And hockey season's back. ESPN plus 1099 a month. Not so bad. All right. Stephen Campos. No, no sponsors. They can sponsor us if they want, but they don't sponsor us. Stephen Campos wrote in and said, hey, guys. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. We got it. At some point, we do have to dedicate time to figuring out what I'm going to play this fall or this this holiday break. Because I want to go in with an intent. I do like Chris's idea of saying, like, taking a little bit of a break. So being very casual about it, but just having something set up. Do I do it? Do I do the Skyrim playthrough? Do I do some Call of Duty? One of the things that joined my my mind here was I never played all the way through Tales of Arise. And there's that huge expansion coming to it as well. So maybe I play that. 
I don't know. We'll figure it out. All right. Stephen Campos, back to you. He says, hey, guys, Colin, the other day, my coworker asked me what game I've been playing lately. I told him that I've been spending most of my free time playing Duolingo because I wanted to learn Spanish. He told me that Duolingo doesn't count as a game. I disagreed with him because Duolingo has gaming elements like leaderboards, experience points. Hell, it even has one point has had a platinum trophies for completing each lesson to the max. Me and him disagreed with each other, and I wanted to know your guys' opinion on this. Please settle the debate. Does using Duolingo to learn Spanish count as playing a game or not? And also, just to protect myself, because I know someone will say this. Yes, I know Duolingo does a bad job at teaching me a language. I use it because it's fun to play. I've never used Duolingo before. I've used others before, um, mostly because they've sponsored the show and I've tried it out. Is learning a language on one of these apps a game, Dustin? Yes, on Duolingo. Well, okay. It is a game when you play it. It it has gaming elements where there's a leaderboard. Uh, you can do team up with people to get high scores, stuff like that. So they do gamify it. But if my friend asks me if what game I'm playing, there's no fucking way I'm saying Duolingo. You know, that's not a proper video game. So yeah. I understand your friend's perspective if you like playing duolingo as a game which also he he made the thing about people saying duolingo does a bad job at teaching you a language that is probably true but if you're just learning the basics of a language my experience using the japanese duolingo was very good and it's been very good for holly she knew a ton of stuff when we were there thanks to duolingo it's not yeah. gonna she's not gonna be fluent from no one's going to be fluent from any app-based thing you need to have a hands-on experience and study groups and stuff like that. But is it a game? Yes, but but don't go and act and acting like you've been doing a lot of hardcore gaming playing. Yeah, it's not. A, it's, Duolingo. it's not a. It's not a video game. I'll put it that. Like I do think it's it's a game in some way, but it's like, it's kind of like people. It's like oh, Jackbox. It's like I know what you mean that when you say like oh, I play Jackbox as right. a video game. I understand, but like intrinsically, we all understand that it's just that that's. It's like those VHS board games. You remember those? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Those are it's like yeah. it's like those where it's like that's not a. It is literally a video game, but it's not a video game. <laughs> it's kind of how I feel about them. I'm a pro Jackbox Party Pack eight player speed run. Yeah, percent. speed run, speed run Jackbox. <laughs> speed run Jackbox. Any percent? Yeah, Jackbox is great. By the way, it's not even to say that, that you know I, I love Jackbox. It's way better than Dude, fucking Cards Against Humanity. I hate Dude, Cards Against fuck Humanity. Fuck Cards Against Humanity. I'll say it every episode. It is enough. It, Get it, that shit out of here. Look, it's it's it, Cards Against Humanity is like Pokemon to me, where it's like it's it's your first. It's your I get it. It's your first raunchy adult like. Uh, you know, in-person kind of board game experience. So, so for that, it's like, you know what? Fine. It's fine for like eighth graders or whatever, but Jackbox is truly out of pocket. If you're playing, if you're playing, if you're playing with a, a similarly minded group of people, it's, I love the ease it's of crazy. just using your phone as a controller and stuff. I just, there's just very, yeah, it's, awesome. yeah. it's, it's very, it's very smart, very intelligent, yeah. uh, the way it's designed and all that stuff. But at the same time, I wouldn't say that, Oh, what game you've been playing? Oh man, dude. I've been mainlining Jackbox. Yeah, the Jackbox. Have you guys series. played uh there's a, a Jackbox game called Job Job. Have you heard I have of not this played one? that. No. I've heard that name, I think, but I don't know what it is. Dude, okay. So it what makes it you basically write out your answers for job interviews, but then the idea is that it goes through a paper shredder. And so you have to take an amalgamation of everyone's answers and then write your own to the questions. Oh, that's cool. So obviously you have to be as vulgar as possible in order to give everyone else good content <laughs> right. for theirs. And it's great because you can have the fun of being vulgar, but it actually takes some creativity unlike mm. uh, Cards Against Humanity. So yeah. Yeah, I don't remember which one Job Job is on, but that's like one of my all time favorites. I'm, I'm big on Quiplash personally. I, I really like yeah, Quiplash. Yeah, Quiplash is, is good. Is, is I think iconic. I played that at Achievement Hunter. Like way back. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> <a> funny. <Whoa. laughs> I heard Achievement Hunter went away, actually. That they like. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, those guys are, are doing something something else. I had a buddy there, um, Alfredo Alfredo Diaz. I used to work with him at IGN, and he became like a late a latter day achievement hunter, let's say. Yeah. And he was working there for a while. He was a nice guy. Um, okay. I think that's all we have to say for this. Duolingo a game. By the way, I think that to some of the commenters out there. Duolingo for English. <laughs> Connor Campbell wrote in <laughs> and said, hi, CDC. 
You guys have spoken in the past about physical games, but what about memorabilia? I still see collector's editions being released, but I've seen less advertising for posters, books, individual models, figurines, and so on. I myself collect the art books and they are now being released late. It used to be the week of, it is now up to a year later. The Jedi Survivor art book, for example, is not out until February. Mirage in April and Spider-Man 2 also in April. Why do you think this is? And also, do you see less of a push on memorabilia? It's funny you say this, Connor, because and I was curious what you guys thought of this because I see it from my perspective as the exact opposite. Like when I see things, um, I told you that they're not out yet, so I don't have them here, but they re- they're finally releasing these Mega Man vinyl toys that are like really dope. Um, and they look super cool. They're, they're, they're perfect. And they're, it's really the first time we're getting perfect Mega Man toys. And I was like, in my mind, Dustin, I'm like, man, only today would we be able to get this? In other words, it seems yeah. it's, it's very similar to this company. We have we our audience is not nearly big enough to sustain us if we were like a radio show or something, but we're not. We have a, mm-hmm. a subscription model. It's like your local video store back in the day or something. And so we're able to circumvent the realities of of like general advertising level business or whatever and get our stuff to immediately to customers. That's what I feel about this stuff. It's like, yeah, we can make a Mega Man toy. It's not going to go sit in a Toys R Us fucking bargain bin because no one goes to Me- Toys R Us looking for Mega Man like back in the day when they made Mega Man toys in the 90s. And so we can find our people and then I get advertisements for them and my friends tell me about them. So while it seems like maybe art books are suffering because I don't know anything about art books, it seems like the stuff that I would be interested in. Like my mind is always if I see something for G.I. Joe or Castlevania, I pretty much always buy it. And it's happening more often for Mega Man in a major way the last few years. Mm -hmm. So that's my perspective, but it's limited. Dustin, you're a, a buyer of merch. You have your fucking skeevy in glass figurines and. You haven't put her in glass yeah. yet. I think it's something you said about one year. Oh, in the jar. In the jar. That's what it was. In the yeah, jar. The jar. Yeah. I mean, Heinous. it's not for display. That's for utility. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I'm all. I love. I mean, this is my. I, I wear game shirts all the time. My. This is from Elden Ring. My Blythe shirt. I got this one in Japan. But yeah, you're exactly right, Colin, in that it's better than ever for merch of more obscure and and niche things because. They can release them and just they don't have to be at a brick and mortar store. They can just, you know, go out to whoever wants particular things. And so as far as the art books are concerned, my guess about that is that do you guys remember a few years ago that a lot of leaks Mm -hmm. about games Mm -hmm. came from art books? That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, Yeah. I'm sure they take six six months to a year to put together and so a developer has to send all of these assets or art assets to a company that's putting a separate company putting this book together who fucking knows what they're doing so i imagine that at some point they're saying we're not doing that anymore we're, we'll make the art book after the game is out so there's no risk uh well i guess not no risk but we are minimizing the risk specifically in this area that we're going to see any leaks so i wouldn't read that as indicative of the market around game memorabilia but i i don't know particularly i feel like game memorabilia there's stuff ever look look at gamestop that's all they sell now practically is gaming memorabilia yeah. and so yeah i'm i'm a big fan obviously i'm a huge amiibo collector and that's one of the main yeah, ways that i like to there. to buy oh yeah 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 and um, that dude they're releasing sora soon so I'm oh very great excited about it. great i'm buying um, two yeah. Two Soras, one one to open and one to keep in the box. I can't That's wait. Great. I was looking at uh, Mike is playing the newest Fire Emblem game and I she gets so mad at me because I picked it up. I'm like, oh, we're going to get two more of the same characters in Smash Brothers. And she'll oh, say something yeah. like, oh, <laughs> shut up and leave me alone kind of situation. Um, are you buying anything, Chris, any of this memorabilia recently? Because I, I think you're right on with the art books, Dustin. That That's why they're yeah. just like, no, we'll just not even do this until afterwards. But are you seeing, are you interested in buying any of this stuff? Are you seeing it lull or or you know, ever flow, let's say. I don't, I don't seek it out necessarily. I, I it really depends. I, I do buy a lot of art books just because I like, um, a lot of times the stuff in there is like really interesting. I have a, I have, um, a death stranding art book that I have in my office in New York that I really, really like. And, and even just like stuff that's extraneous, like there's, there's all, there's these, um, I think I might've shown them off on the show, on the show before, but the, specifically there are these destiny, these destiny hardcover lore books called the grimoire and they have like they, there's like three volumes of it and it's just like actual like a tome almost and I, I like that shit where it's like oh this could you, unless you knew what this was you would probably have it would probably just blend in you know i i do like the occasional uh, the, the the occasional 
garish statue. The occasional Halo 2 blanket hung up. Yeah, yeah, th- yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got that custom made actually. So it's, it's like it's sick, technically dude. it's amazing. I love it. Yeah. And there's a couple of other things like that, too. Like I have some pretty much every time my birthday rolls around or Christmas, someone will give me like some Master Chief thing because it's just like a safe assumption. It's like, all right, Chris loves Halo. But I have so many. I have so many Master Chiefs now. I'm like, I don't know what to do with these fucking things. I have several at my house at my parents house. I have several here. I'm good. (laughs) I'm good. If you want to give me like something crazy, like, oh, hey, here's like a needler or something dope or like here's like a you know some vaguely associated thing that's like not just a figurine of the main guy cool but uh i i peruse every once in a while uh but nothing's really caught my eye Uh, i have to really go out of my way to find stuff but the dangerous thing is then i won't stop buying them because i really like that shit i remember years ago i wish i had done this back then i wish i had the foresight to to know that they these wouldn't be around forever but when they made the um they had like a Gears of War Lancer, like a proper replica of like the chainsaw gun in Gears of War one or two. I can't remember which one that was like life size, like genuinely real. Like it was like weighty and you could hang it up or whatever or use it as like a prop or whatever, you, whatever the hell you wanted. And I thought that was that's so cool. I'll wait on that. And then I waited too long because that's something that I definitely would have bought. It's dangerous, though, because those are so expensive and I love them and I love the way they look and they're so fucking cool. Uh, that I have to, I have to temper myself. So I don't, I'd make a habit of not searching. If I come across one in a store or if someone sends me something like, Hey, this is available, then I'll go get it. But I, I keep myself on a tight leash with that stuff. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I was thinking when you were saying that about my own want of a biker scout outfit from Star Wars, from Return of the Jedi specifically, and how that is, I want to get that like a body of armor, like a suit of armor. And you can literally yeah. go and buy those. And I'm like the kid with the vein popping out of his head. Mm. trying to Because I really don't want to do any, and I don't really want any Star Wars stuff generally, but that was like a dream of mine as a kid. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I, can have, just, I can look like one of these mother. I can literally wear that armor, you know, and yeah, walk around yeah. the house with it. To, to the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so cool. Especially without the helmet on, because I think it would look so, you know, very rarely see stormtroopers without their helmets. And I think that's such a cool look. Yeah. Just walking about. Helmet yeah, it's cool. It's, 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 especially when they're holdovers from like when you were a kid and you just couldn't like, I, I remember specifically like the Halo 3 Legendary Edition with the helmet was something that I got way later. I got that in like 2017, 2018 or something when I finally decided like, oh, I have money now. <laughs> I can finally own this thing that was like yes. completely out of my reach when I was right. a kid. Yeah, you don't even think about uh, it when you're a kid. It's like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it's just yeah, like, I guess I, oh, well, it's, it's out of my, that's for, <laughs> that's for Bill Gates. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I really thought like at that time it was that expensive, like, so, like prohibitively so to the point where I was just like, I guess, I guess only like lavish people have this thing. And then I got it, but I still even like, I, there's a limited edition Halo Reach statue that I think is gorgeous and it has all the noble team guys on it. It looks awesome. I still have not pulled the plug on it. I could, but it's just like I know the second I do it, it's a snowball because then I'm going to be like, what else is out here? And for how cheap can I get it? Or like how how pristine is everything else? Too much. What I want to get into more and more, like, and you really can only you have to go to Japan for this stuff, is I like want just the unique, weird... Mega Man and Castlevania stuff that was in stores, like store displays, posters, stuff from the studios. And what I would really die for and I would spend good money on is like original concept art and stuff. That's where there's like oh, a, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In, in G.I. Joe collectibles, there are people that collect prototype figures, like the drawings. There's a whole market of it that's like prototype very figures? expensive. I'm sorry? Prototype figures? But, yeah, like not not prototype the series. Oh, pro, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't get too excited. But yeah, sorry. Like the, these undeveloped and uh, like like pieces and sculpts and all the art and stuff from Hasbro. And there's a whole market because like people just randomly worked there and had all this stuff, you know, marketers and stuff. And then they would just sit in their attic and they realize, holy shit, this stuff is worth a fucking fortune. And mm-hmm. they start selling all of it. That's I want to get there for Mega Man at some point if I can. Like yeah. some of that stuff I would kill to have. So like even the, starting with Mega Man 2, all of the bosses in the game, and you guys probably know this, are made by fans. And then they're. So they're submitted in these contests, thousands and thousands of submissions. And then Inafune and his team would redraw them to all like they would pick the winners and redraw them to all look like they belong together. Right. And that they, they have the same style. But I'd love to get that artwork. Like just even yeah. those originals from random people would be. Fucking I, feel, cool. I yeah. feel that way about um, animation cells. 
like like the, the actual cells that they totally. use for like animation like i i saw i saw a dragon ball z one that looked so cool and i was like i and then i, I looked at the price and it was like nine thousand dollars i'm like okay <laughs> all right have a good one dude <laughs> there was a place in japan where i could have bought evangelion concept art and drawings but it was uh prohibitively expensive but it's cool to there's like a whole store in uh nakano broadway that is all animation sales some of them are pr- kind of cheap too for the more unknown stuff but uh, maybe next time josh lee wrote in said hi sacred chodes and he uses an apostrophe s josh duolingo i have been playing games since i can remember I'm 34, but the one thing that has always eluded me is that I have never played an FPS. Friends back in the day were addicted to COD and Halo, etc., but I never, but it never intrigued or piqued my interest. I think I always found third-person games more immersive and fun to play from a personal standpoint. However, with the constant praise you guys give, the Bioshock series and of late Cyberpunk 2077 is now the time to pull the pin. Can the three of you come to a definitive decision of which FPS to play for a first-timer? Love the content as always, and thanks for all that you do. What's funny to me, Chris, is that while Bioshock and Cyberpunk are technically FPSs, I don't consider them literally FPSs in some way. Yeah. Their games yeah. played in a much more dynamic way from a first person perspective in that sometimes you shoot. So if you've never played an FPS or a first person game like that before, that's not where I suggest you play, even though those are the best places you can probably end up. What about just a Call of Duty game? Like, like one of the best Call of Duty campaigns. If you've never played a first person shooter, I think that that's a great place to start. Personally, I don't know which one exactly to to recommend back in the day, I would have recommended modern warfare or something, but we're like well beyond that date. Um, what do you think about this, Chris? You're an expert. Yeah, in I don't know, FPS man. Field. I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of places you can go. I, I would actually say maybe if, if it's your first time, cl- I mean, clearly he knows how to play video games. He's, he's 34. He's played a, a lot of third person games. So it's not, it's not like introducing somebody who's fresh to video games to a first person shooter. So that, that concern is at the window in some way. I would say, honestly, I would say try Portal. I know what you mean. I know what you're going to say. It's like, oh, it's not technically a first person shooter, but it is. It, it is literally a first person shooter in the sense that you, you are just it is a first person game where you are literally spending the entire time shooting, shooting things. It's not adversarial, though. I think it's like really unique. I think it's really interesting. I think it still holds up. Portal 2 especially is wonderful. Um, but I think it's if you've never if you've never played a first person shooter before and you're trying to figure out like what is fun about them and what is cool about them, I think portal does a good job of taking into taking into account level, first person level design and, and, and physics and certain things that are at play in other more combative FPSs, stuff like battlefield or, or call of duty or what have you. I think, so I think either one of those, if you're, if you're looking for a more of a chill experience, I would say, yeah, try, try portal. It's a lot easier. It's a lot, well, not easier in the sense that it's it, it is kind of hard, actually, for a lot of people, but it's less adversarial. But if you're looking to get into like something more action oriented, I, I'd probably suggest a, a Call of Duty game. I, I, do, I think Doom and I think Doom 2016 and Doom, and Doom Eternal are a bit advanced. Yeah, I agree. As far as that goes. Maybe so, even Halo uh, or something. That's what maybe, I was going to say. Halo. Yeah. For, yeah, I think Halo is the most the best logical choice. If you've never played an FPS game, Halo was designed at a time where FPSs were dominated on PC and they wanted to make a true console FPS game. So if you're playing on console, Halo, I feel like it, it, it's before I feel like after with with Call of Duty, they, they realized, oh, we can people actually can play these games and, and pull off really precise shooting, whereas Halo is very much big reticules, you know, like giant, your either your shotgun or your assault rifle. And it's designed top to the bottom for, yeah. for people that weren't used to playing this type of game on consoles. Sure. There was beforehand, but Halo, I feel like was kind yeah, of the big I mainstream. That's probably a good record. Yeah. I th- I think I try not to recommend Halo too much because I understand that I'm too biased towards it. Yeah. Uh, and I have a very particular, uh, history with that that series but i do think like i, I think the, the collection is probably a pretty good place to start i think that's a because halo halo 2 specifically i think is a really good place to start because i think it's it's the most souped up as far as like uh, visuals go because they did all those remastered cutscenes. it's got a really engaging story it's really solid the level design is pretty good 
it plays complicated enough, but it's also still simple because it's from the Xbox time. So I think that's probably a good place to start, maybe. Um, I, wouldn't nece- I wouldn't recommend Infinite, necessarily. Because Infinite's really competitive. <laughs> it's yeah. like really... <laughs> it's, it's, it's rough out there, man. It's good, but it's also like... It, I, I would argue that Infinite right now is, is, a, is fairly advanced for the shit that people are pulling off in it. I would um, say that if Josh is insistent on it being a more modern or newer release game, uh, what about Wolfenstein? The the new Wolfenstein. Yeah, the set. I mean, the new Colossus is hard as fuck, but the the 2014 one, New Order. Yeah, yeah, that would new, be a, that New would Order. Be a, yeah, just know that the first thirty minutes are kind of ass. Yeah, <laughs> that first level is not is not exactly. Yeah, when you're in the plane and shit, it's like yeah. yeah. But I think I still think that that's probably one of the best pure shooters in the last few decades. Honestly. I underscored that game. I gave it a 7.5 at IGN. I think I probably should have given it an eight. If the intro I just thought was like unforgivable. You know, like I yeah. was like, what? Why did it's you bad guys? Intro. It's a bad why intro. did you do this? You know, I, and but, I, I loved it. I love the old blood as well. The expansion. Go ahead. Yeah. But honestly, but honestly, I, I, I think anything that we've listed so far is, is probably a pretty safe place. To so at, at the very least, you can look at the list of things that we've given you. We've given you Call of Duty, uh, Halo, um, Wolfenstein, The New Order portal i think those are like between those four i would say like maybe look at do some research on them see which one interests you the most and then and then just pull the trigger on one of them no pun intended uh i think uh you'll that's a pretty safe selection and it's varied by the way very widely on on different types of experiences portal is very funny and puzzle oriented halo is very sci-fi call of duty is very modern military and obviously wolfenstein is very very old history. school yeah 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 alternate history so i think that's a pretty safe group of games to start out with if, you, if you've if you never played a first person shooter before right i think it's pretty fair. yeah i think so too yeah. i mean i would because this is a playstation podcast and we have that sort of um or at least i do have that, that sort of inclination it's like i would recommend to you kill zone or resistance but the reality is is that outside of shadowfall you can't even play any kill zone or resistance games right now so unless you have yeah. them on ps3 or want to play yeah. some of them on PlayStation <laughs> so, Cloud. so you would be so you would be punished you would be punished immediately for liking it because <laughs> yeah. then you're like oh man I, w- I would love to play more of this and then you can't so yeah because pound for pound I think resistance 3 is probably the best single player shooter I've ever played like raw first person shooter and that's why I, cyber I don't I don't consider I definitely don't consider Bioshock a first person shooter but even something like cyberpunk I don't consider a first person shooter either Cyberpunk not, to me yeah. is a first person action RPG um, yeah that 100%. where you can shoot guns in it and Bioshock to me is a first person action adventure game where if you're smart, you're not using guns most of the time. Anyway, you're using plasmids and your fucking wrench to save your ammo for crazier ad- adventures. So I don't consider it's not that I'm trying to be pedantic. It's just that when I say first person shooter, what I mean is a game where you are shooting things in yeah. first person like that's Bioshock Infinite, though. Yeah. Bioshock Infinite, though, is a, I would argue is a is is definitely more of a first yes, person shooter definitely. and i and i would say that's actually, actually that's actually a pretty good one and in my i actually really loved the way that game played a lot of people really didn't i i just don't agree but like that is something that you might want to consider as, as something that's like more of like a like an iffy line i loved it but it's not um, a snappy shooter i think that's what people were looking for especially at that time you know see that's I, the thing I was, it's like i feel like it's i feel like it's pretty snappy i was uh <laughs> i liked it and i think you're probably right especially with a lot of the the movement in the game plus the plasmids or whatever they call them in that game the it's funny when that game came out in 2013 i was really not into it i was like i played it i remember just playing that old opening columbia scene and just being like why is why do they turn into a shooter i'm shooting more characters right now than i've ever shot in a bioshock game before and i got really turned off by it and it wasn't until a couple of years later that i was like i'll try this again <laughs> and yeah. i was like what a, what a fucking asshole you know what are you doing <laughs> holy shit so um yeah you have some good options there you could play Shadowfall if you're looking for a PlayStation game. It's it's a great shooter, in my opinion. Some people don't like it as much as I do, but it's coming into the game at the very or series at the very end of it. So it would kind yeah. of not make a lot of sense. Or uh, we're, we're shooting out everything now, but like half, there's a Half-Life one is I, I would argue is still really good. <laughs> I wish they'd release it, them on PlayStation. But, but that's 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 wow. my opinion. There's also a Black Mesa kind of mod version that's mm. a little bit more up to date that I think is really really excellent. Um. But yeah, that's plenty. You've got you've got more than enough to pick which one suits you and your interest the most. 
Emmett wrote in and said, hi, Sacred Boys. Skull Island Rise of Kong is drawing a lot of coverage <laughs> and ire from the gaming space, which isn't a surprise. The game looks like shit. Even Kotaku called it an ugly mess of a thing, which made me wonder, isn't this precisely what the games media has been asking for? There's a popular image of a lounging Sonic with a speech bubble above him that reads, I want shorter games with worse graphics made by people who are paid more to work less. And I'm not kidding. I can't speak to whether or not the developers were paid more than the industry standard, but Skull Island certainly fits the description. Why isn't the industry celebrating this game? Would love to hear your thoughts. Emmett, I don't really understand your point because no one wants bad games. This game, by the way, Skull, uh, Skull, what is it called? Skull Island Rise of Kong. Rise of Kong. I hear is worse even than the Gollum game. I don't know if that's true or not. It is. And the, it is. The, the screenshots of it, I mean, uh, this looks like a... I don't know. I don't want to say a PS2 game. Certainly like an early gen PS3 game. PS2 is probably a little dramatic, but even then it just looks all janky and fucked up. It's like a third person action game um, yeah. where you play as King Kong, but it's developed by Iguana B. Game Mill is the publisher. Huge surprise because Game Mill fucking sucks. Sucks. Yeah, yeah stay away they, from Game Mill. I don't understand. They did the Cobra Kai games. They did the G.I. Joe Operation Blackout game, which I platinumed, but I, and it's one of my rarest platinum trophies. And I fucking hated it. I was like, why did you guys? They, they're, they're just a budget license house. And that's it. And they put out all these garbage games. But they're about to but they're about to release Nickelodeon Kart Racer Slime Speedway 3. Oh, boy. Maybe that'll be better. It'll probably be better than this. You know, and they I, do yeah. the All-Star Brawl games, Chris, too. Hmm, interesting. They did, well, they published them, but they published them. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. But yeah, still, this, it, it's not a huge surprise. I guess is what I'm saying that this game is is bad. But I think you're kind of conflating two things. I know that that's a meme. I know the exact meme you're talking about, about like people want their people to work less. And so the games become worse and stuff. But you're conflating two different things. A, a, a well-organized, hardworking team can make a great game and not be abused in the process, certainly. But I also agree, I think, with the tenor of your argument where you're saying, well, maybe we're we're overstating what the what the employment abuse would be and all the rest. Okay, fair enough, but let's not conflate two things. Let's just celebrate the horribleness that is Skull Island: Rise of Kong yeah. in a vacuum. It's from Game I, Mill. I, you know? I would also like to say, yeah, uh, Skull Island: Rise of Kong is not a bad game because it's ugly. <laughs> it's a bad game because it's fucking horrible. Yeah, that's true. You can have a, a you can have a game that looks as bad as this, like like graphically or like. Uh, art assets wise but if you had like a solid game underneath it it would still not be like a 9 out of 10 but it would at least still be like reasonable reasonable to play from the gameplay that i've seen of this game it is fucking tragic it is it is really really bad like on a gameplay level not just like oh it looks ugly so i would just i just want to i just want to point that out like it's not it's not the looks of the game that's the problem if that's just that just makes it even worse than it already is which is just to say it, it really is it's worse than Gollum. like by every metric that i've seen it's like ride to hell retribution tier <laughs> <laughs> which is great we haven't had one of those in a long time <laughs> uh <laughs> dustin any closing thoughts here on skull island before we get to the final inquiry yeah, I don't know what the deal was. I saw that about this game being bad, but I don't know who this shit is for. <laughs> Specifically, it's not like there's a big push for a King Kong game right now. It's not like it's a movie tie in. It's like, oh, we can get some people that's, that are excited about the movie. Not, that's because you're not hanging out in the in crowd, Dustin. You don't know the, <laughs> the real, you know, the real clamoring that's been going on behind the scenes for uh, for, uh, <laughs> for a real modern action retelling of uh, what is it? skull island rise of kong yeah isn't yeah. it funny i think matt it was maybe maddie put out a video about this but i saw other comparisons too that the 2006 xbox 360 launch game peter jackson's king kong is better it looks probably looks definitely looks and probably plays better dude, I, remember it that looks, game. I, wrote, I wrote the strategy guide for that game dude that dude game. seeing gameplay footage of that game next to this it it <laughs> like it makes that King Kong game look like the last of us part two. Like it's, it is <laughs> insane how gorgeous that 2006, 2005 uh, King Kong game on 360 looks in comparison to whatever the fuck this is. It's, it's awesome. Nuts. Love it. Um, yeah. Yeah. 2005. Love. It was, yeah. Launch Xbox 360 game. Yeah. I think underrated mm -hmm. game. If I remember correctly, I remember liking it, but also like never playing it again. So I don't, I don't know how it holds up or anything, but like, I feel like, I feel like that was a good game. 
I was busy playing Perfect Dark Zero and oh, pretending yeah. to like it. Oh man, that was fun. Yeah, because I had a new Perfect. Xbox. I'm like, this is this is fun. This is good. I spent a, I spent a lot of money. I have yeah. to justify my purchase. Like it. It's fun. <laughs> what do you mean I spend sixty dollars on a twenty hour game and then I just have to let it sit there? What do you mean Hexic HD is the best thing on this thing? <laughs> Dude, Hexic HD, that game fucking rules. It was great was to be fair, game. but it wasn't as good as Uno, which everybody had except that one guy. <laughs> Oh, but man. uh yeah Bloodfig oh, wow. a wrote in with the final inquiry it says hello D- dcc the release of metal gear solid master collection volume one is imminent and i'm looking forward to playing these games for the first time however i'm met oh, with shit. the all too common conundrum do i play the games in release order or chronological order what would you recommend for the metal gear solid game specifically and do you guys go release order or chronological one going through a larger series in general thanks and take care um you got to go in order of what dustin you have something to say I read this earlier. I was prepping for the show and I read this and this co- the question enraged me. How? No, no, absolutely under no fucking circumstance. Did you play these in some kind of timeline chronological order? No, <laughs> absolutely yeah. not. Maybe you're ignorant. I'm sorry. Sorry if I'm yelling at you. But the way these get, I, since I just played through these, you are going to fuck everything up if you do that that way. Play yeah. Metal Gear Solid first. Then play Metal Gear Solid 2. Then play Metal Gear Solid 3. End of story. If you don't, yeah. I'm going to come to your house. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to do something. Uh, Movieproofshoot.com. <laughs> That's a reference to James Tom Bob Strike Back when he would go, they would go door to door and say, like, Dude. are you Magnolia fan on, poop, on moviepoopshoot.com and then beat the shit out of you. The, the, thing, that, the thing that bothers me about this question, I, 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 first of all, you got to chill, Dustin. That was, that was a lot I of rage. I, I, I felt a I lot of rage. I saw this. I was like, no. No, if you're replaying them, maybe and you want to get oh they reference right, that's, no. that's what I was gonna that's what I was gonna say. A chronological playthrough of a series is acceptable once you've played it already, because you have to understand like these games came out in this order for a reason, which means that they were designed like t- to account for the fact that they were happening at the point in time that people were playing them. So it's not like it doesn't really benefit you in any way other than as a fan. Like I've absolutely don't get, don't get me wrong. I've absolutely played like Halo Wars, Halo Reach, Halo one, two, ODST three, you know, in that order. But that's after I had played them already multiple times in the order that they came out. You know what I mean? Perfectly legal. That is, that is generally the safe way to go about it. When you're introducing Mm. yourself to an, to a, to a, to a franchise that uh, you've never played, experience before just go just go in the order of release it's 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 the best way they're designed for that in the first place save yourself the confusion because it's going to be very 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 confusing if you go back and and try to piece this shit together from a timeline perspective because first of all even doing that research alone would spoil a lot of the games for you in the first place to figure out which what goes where and just don't just go in blind in release order that is the safest way to do it agreed i totally agree as well it's just too risky otherwise you're you're, you're playing around with the, the level of gameplay as well and you should just experience them the way the market experienced them i think is is the best way so i think we're all in agreement here yeah i didn't expect to have so much passion from you though Dustin. Yeah, yeah this has been this has been i'm just thinking about it's someone festering that, inside of you i remember the end of metal gear solid 2 when i was in what third grade 2003 or something i remember thinking about that ending how crazy it was and what it meant for the future and then metal gear solid 3 you're like whoa this is an this is a sequel very much still in story but in, in a way that i could never even imagine yeah and if you if you play metal gear solid 3 first yeah, it's, uh, yeah. You won't get any of that. How dare you? Well, all right. On that note. <laughs> now on that note, yeah. let's end the show. That's it. That's all we have for this episode of Sacred Symbols of PlayStation Podcast. Thank you for being here with us today. Let's go around the horn and say goodbye to everyone. Chris, goodbye to you. Have a good rest of your day. Yeah, goodbye to you guys. I'm, I'm really excited. I think so. It, it, tonight, right? Is, yeah, tonight. Is Spider, Spider-Man? Yeah, it's all pre, pre, or it's all preloaded on mine. Yeah. Excited. I got I to gotta preload that now, but looking forward to it. Probably not going to sleep. <laughs> Yeah, right on. I'm looking forward to it, too. I'm going to try to get through. I want to try to platinum Miles Morales before it comes out and see what, if I can just get it out of the way. So we'll see what happens. But definitely get to it tomorrow or this weekend at the very latest. But uh, Dustin, goodbye to you. Goodbye. I uh, am very excited. Nice, relaxing weekend of games. My travel has been sandwiched 
you know, I was in Chicago last weekend. Then we've got this weekend at home. And then next weekend, we'll be heading down to Virginia. Oh, down here. That's right. Down here. For the nuptials. I'm really excited (laughs) because uh, the DC crowd, which is my parents, Ben and Emily, and me and Holly, Gene Park will be joining us on the journey down even further south. So we're going to have a nice little crew. Right on. Very fun. Looking forward to seeing everyone. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but we'll have one more episode in between now and then. That's when the, that's right. when things are going to get real nervous for me. No, I'm, I'm fine, though. I'm feeling good. Good. I just have to cut my hair at some point. Um, but I'll do that probably this weekend. You just put nair in your shampoo. Yeah. Yeah. Just get, just get it all over with. Just get it yeah, all done. Exactly. Fuck up my hair. And then when it, it never grows back and then I have a realization like that guy in Seinfeld that was dating Elaine where he realizes he's bald. Ah, tail end. We got one in at the tail end yeah. of the show. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get the hell out of here, my friends. Thank you for your time, and thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support of all things Sacred Symbols. Last Day Media, patreon.com slash media, early ad, free access, et cetera, lastdaymedia.store for merch. We'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye. See ya. Take care, guys. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash Media. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.